Good morning, everyone. Happy winter, almost solstice, right? Four days to the solstice. Um, days are getting colder and darker. And if you're out there with us virtually, welcome. And to all of those that made their way to Baltimore, thank you for being here, appreciate it. We are gonna do um, an opening round of introductions of the task force so we can just do a roll call, which means I need to switch to another sheet here um, to just go down through that and make sure we know who all is with us in entirety. That means here's our contact. Okay, let me just go down through the list that I have, Joe, and if I miss someone, let me know. And to the team that's taking notes, you're on it. Okay, bear with us today. Um, always a little complicated here, pulling everything together. So let me just go down through the list I have and then make sure I think we have everybody. Uh, Delegate Stewart, with us online or anywhere? We have one person, I don't see the name, but we have one person joined via phone, 3315. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, Secretary Flora, she is here and present. Theo just ran down, was that Theo that just ran downstairs? Back down. I think. Yeah, he's here, that's all. Yeah, I think he just ran back and down for his phone. Uh, Mako Urban County Rep, Lori Paris. With us online? Okay. We have audio at all from them. Just trying to do a thumbs up that we have audio from the panelists joining virtually. All right, thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Sorry, folks, just want to try to get everybody accounted for. Uh, Mako Rural County Rep, Amy. Good morning. More doc, yay, there we go. Hi, Amy. I can, I can also let you know that uh, Lori let, told me that she's gonna be a few minutes late, but she's on her way. Oh, perfect, thanks for letting us know that. Okay, good to know. So we'll mark her as here then. Um, right. Uh, next is James Gaston, MML Urban Municipality Rep. James said he'll be here in person today. He emailed me this morning. He's just running a little late. He did. Okay. Um, Councilman Hoff. Right here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, so I'm here. trying to get everybody together here. Okay. The MML Rural Municipality Rep. Okay. David Thaller. David, you with us? He also said he would be going virtually. He emailed He's the still recovering, yeah. right? Yeah, he had an ankle surgery. Okay, I know David is probably going to join in here. Uh, Maryland Association of Realtors, Tiffany Harris. I'm here. There you go. Hey, Tiffany. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, okay, Quinn Griffith. Good morning. Good morning, Quinn. Are you on? On. Uh, Camera, can we? There you are, Quinn. Thank you. Hey, Quinn is the Chesapeake Region Chapter of Community Association Institute. That's correct. Okay, great. Okay, Deborah Bulo. Good morning. I'm here. There's Deborah. Okay, AIA. Priscilla Kenya. Kenya. I didn't hear from her either way. She's usually in person. AARP. Probably run a little late. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mandy's here. Hi, Mandy. Hi. <laughs> Marilyn Coalition of Interior Designers. Jennifer Ray. Jennifer's usually here. She might be still coming. I love her description. Individual professional experience in planning and development of roads and highways. AICP. Okay. Lisa Bacastro. Oh, uh, Lisa... You shouldn't be on that list anymore. It's Isabella. It's Isabella. Chelsea, Chelsea sorry. Yeah. Chelsea. Yeah. Hi, Chelsea. That's okay. Sorry. I'm here. <laughs> okay. I have an old list then. You got some new people just showed up. Okay. Oh, there's Priscilla. Hi. Come on in. Parking. Yeah. Yeah. Have a seat. Right here. Hi. David Baylor is here too. He just okay. So we have um, Chelsea. Okay. Who did I miss out? Okay. So Chelsea's representing. You're with. Ageability and disability. Yeah. Okay. Isabella is here with aging. Okay. Is that everybody, Joe? 
Oh, uh, Victoria, it's David Thaler. I have a broken ankle, but I'm here uh, virtually. I'm so sorry for your ankle and you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You get Tiffany, Harris. Two more weeks that I get the cast off. Oh, good for you. We'll take care and make sure you do that physical therapy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that's everybody. We do have some guests here for the panel, but I'll have them introduce themselves when we get to the panel discussion. Okay. Probably hopefully okay. 9.30. It might be a little bit later than that. But. Okay. Great. Uh, guests and the members of the public, uh, please sign in at some point if you haven't yet. To let us know you're here. Uh, okay, Lori Paris just arrived. Okay, and Scylla's here. Y'all have got everything over on our roll call. We're good. Okay, sorry, folks. Just always, I know it took me twice as amount of time to get somewhere yesterday because there were construction and roads, and it's just difficult to get around. Um, I don't know if there's any easy location these days um, to get to anywhere other than virtual, and I like seeing everybody. So with that, we're going to get back to the agenda and get moving here. Let me just open up my file again. Um, yep. Presentation. There we go. Okay, so we are going to go through, you want to go down to the objectives, let me get to that, and then through these first few. Okay, so just kind of general overview, because we do have this report due in June, we're going to be trying to make sure we have outcomes, at least draft outcomes from every meeting. So we'll be going through that. Actually, Joe, go back to the um, agenda again, so we kind of walk through that first. So we have those draft outcomes. Staff basically takes everything each time. We're going to kind of keep developing the report as we go. It'll be a draft. Everybody will get another shot at it, but we've got to try to keep, keep this all moving. Um, so after we go through the updates, we'll go through those draft of what we think reflect the last meeting, specific to zoning use and approval processes. Um, we do have a planning director plan of discussion. Thank you to everyone that agreed to sign up for that. We'll probably do a little seat shuffle at that time so we can welcome folks here in person and introduce them. Um, and then today's topic will be lot requirements. And so we'll dig in on that just like we did last time for, for use. Then we have our public comment and then we'll do a closing round. So by the closing round, hopefully everyone will still be with us and counted for and any final observations, thoughts you have, that'll be the time that we make sure everybody weighs in on that. And can you all make sure I've got that full list of who's here for that closing round? That way I know who to call on. Um, great. So objectives for today, similar to the agenda, um, basically compare, contrast, measure the ADU ordinance provisions, their impacts on ADU construction, develop preliminary legislative recommendations, file a list of best practices, receive review and discuss public comment. Um, I have been reading all the public comments. I hope you all have also. Uh, really good inputs that we need to ensure are being taken into consideration in our deliberations. The one thing I want to make really clear to anybody that's listening from the public, we are not a decision-making body. We are basically gathering information, pulling that information together, creating a report that will essentially share that compilation of what we have learned and what we have found. And we will have some recommendations for uh, the legislature, but we are not a decision-making body. We will just simply pull all that together and come out with what we hope will be able to reach some level of consent um, to advance in the way of recommendations, but only for consideration, not for our decision-making. Um, so the next thing, we'll get to administrative updates, and I will turn it over to Joe for that, who will be taking us through today's agenda. Um, and the real discussion will start um, when we get into that deep dive on lots. So right now, first few items were really just kind of taking comments. Oh, thank you, sir. Joe, over to you. Yeah, and I want to thank my colleagues that are supporting me here today. I've uh, got the tech crew over here monitoring the chat, taking notes. Thank you. And again, we have Adam Snyder, our counsel here, um, who's taking notes and doing research to support uh, so, so thank you all for being here. For everybody else you don't see, like John Coleman, who's helping run this uh, virtually. So I know uh, there's been some desire for potentially change up the meeting location from here. I, I, I do appreciate you all understanding I was not able to turn around a new meeting location in three weeks since the last one. So I 
I'm glad you're here today. Uh, I, I would like to know where people are coming from. So I know where a lot of you work. I'm not sure everybody's, but this is early in the morning. So people are probably driving from home, I imagine. So is, you know, central Maryland, like, is that is it a good location? I know we had the first one in Crownsville that had all its tech issues, but like the Annapolis area, anywhere in central Maryland, does that work? Or is that a problem for anybody as we continue to explore new locations? Let me frame it another way. Okay. <laughs> to try to get to some conclusion. We, we are open to the reality that people are coming from all over. We really appreciate everyone's time in that regard. Um, for us, despite this morning's little, little bump of technology, for us, the setup here is one that we know, and it makes it a little easier for our team after a couple of different locations that weren't ideal for us. But we want to make sure we maximize input. Um, from everybody and maximize everybody's opportunity to participate. And so I want to find out, I guess, how many people find the Baltimore location here in this office a big problem? Raise your hand if you're online. I see one hand up online that that's a big issue. Okay. And who else? So I, it, it, the parking is the yeah, issue. That is that's, so if we can bake the parking situation more palatable, which we have time to work on, that would make it doable for you. Okay. Online, who did we saw? I mean, Deborah. Okay, I want to hear from the two of you of your thoughts on the Baltimore location and just um, any alternative because nothing's going to be perfect. Deborah. For me, slightly slightly too far to make it in time i dropped my son off at school and getting in virginia so getting from Ooh. there up there is is pretty hard to do is a is a later time like is it a time issue like if we started at 9 30 would that I be could easier? probably make i could probably make 9 30 happen okay so a time adjustment and better parking mm -hmm. would help make this conducive for everyone but i don't but, want i don't want my need to be no, the reason i think that nine do that. I, I think nine's tough for everybody in yeah, a lot it, of ways it's, i mean the child i do the same thing the child is dropping off i had to get someone to drop us okay so we have another hand on that and i, I think yeah. that's that's rough for other well, well also i think like traffic would be traffic better at, if yes. you're aiming for an opportunity for me i that would be the case okay so that's I would love that. yeah. that's that's good to know that's really good input okay and I saw another hand up out there. Amy. Uh, good morning. Yes, I mean, uh, coming from the Eastern Shore, I'm coming Mark. from Betterton in the morning. Um, the traffic is an issue. I know I left uh, very early last time and I was still late, uh, you know, due to traffic issues. A later start would be fine. Um, if you're comfortable with Zoom participation, Zoom is fine for me as well. I just had the distinct impression that was not a desirable means of participation, but um, that works for me as well because uh, the commute for me can be over three hours. So that turns this into an all day commitment. So it's yeah. hard to schedule other items. Right. Yeah. Thanks. I being a Chestertown resident, I totally get that. <laughs> on that commute, it's not easy. It's not fun. Um, did anyone else raise their hand that felt that Baltimore was a real challenge? Okay. I'm going to come out of this with a time change to 9:30 and uh, figure it out. Make the parking better. Um, for you all, we will get on that. To the extent that people can confirm well in advance that you're coming in person with, is it Yasmin that's doing parking? Um, we, will, we will make that better for everybody. Um, I think the, to Amy's point about Zoom, Zoom is definitely an option. I think we just have better deliberation, but if there's someone, I, I think it's more of you feeling you're getting heard and us having the continuity of one technology system here that we can ensure we've got coverage. So when people are raising hand or we need the discussion, um, it, that we make sure that people feel like they're being heard from that standpoint. But I'm, I'm certainly totally comfortable with it. We obviously 
like in-person dialogue, but I think, you know, I get it, Amy, believe me. <laughs> I've been caught up in that, in that traffic from these for sure. Um, so let's go with that. We're gonna basically agree that Zoom continues to be an option for everybody on the task force. I'm gonna leave it up to you all to make sure you tell us if you don't feel like you're getting heard in these meetings, if you're on the virtual. Um, we're gonna adjust to 930 and we're gonna solve the parking. Does that work, Joe? You're gonna help us with DPS? I will, <laughs> okay. I will. I was just the secretary <laughs> show here last I, time. I need, I need your voice, because we I, had and we're trying this time, and they were not budging. I will go directly <laughs> to Secretary Chadre. We will make this, we will figure this out. Yes, James. I apologize for being late, James Gass and Town of Brentwood. I just parked in the E lot that I was um, instructed to do. The, uh -huh. the gate was up, so I don't oh, know if I need to happen sometimes. Um, yeah, the gate was down. <laughs> I tried to park on that flat, and it was yeah. there, and I just had to yeah. yeah. So, do I need to register my vehicle? Or is it going to get towed? No, no, I have to go out two hours in the lot. The question might be getting out. We'll, 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 we'll get the gates down, but we will get We will get Nobody's going to go in the lot. We will escort you all down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure everybody gets out. We will get this better. And we're I will seeing, talk to the secretary. We're sticking with the third Tuesday, correct? Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, okay. Stick with yes. the dates. Okay. Yes. I'm just going to do a yep. time shift. And if there's any way to go from 9 to 12, we will for two and a half hours. Or, But if we feel like we just can't fit that in, we might have to go to 12 30. Okay. And we'll have the ability to make that as, as efficient as possible. Um, maybe we do a check-in when we come in so I have a better way of doing the roll call or something so we can maybe make some efficiency, pick up some efficiency there. Okay, folks, thank you for, as we continue to try to make this work as best as possible for everyone. Um, so back to you, Joe. Sure. For the rest I can get right through this pretty quickly. Uh, so thank you all who have helped distribute the builder and developer survey. As of the last time I checked, which was yesterday morning, we only had 13 responses. So I don't think I'm ready to start sharing those, the summary of those responses yet, but I will keep it open until February 2nd. Um, I, I've sent that all to you all with some language that you can share. Uh, so please continue to, to encourage people to take it and, and spread the word on the survey. So we're, we're making a lot of progress on our focus groups and panels. We have one today. We have a focus group of um, ADU owners, residents, aging and accessibility advocates on January 5th. Uh, I sent out the final confirmation of the location for that. That will be down at MHT's offices, Crownsville, where we met the first time, not in the same room. Uh, that's January 5th from 12 to 1. We'll probably run a little long. Um, and then we're working, we're about halfway there on the February 20th focus group of HOAs and uh, community organizations. And then the last, uh, that's a panel discussion in the meeting. And the last one, which obviously we haven't prioritized because it's not till March, is the one with housing organizations in March. I have, I, uh, thanks to my colleague at DHCD, Justin Fair, I'm getting close to having somebody to, to join the January meeting, the next meeting, to discuss the uh, racist legacy of housing policies that we've discussed the past couple of meetings. Um, it's not confirmed yet, but I think we're close. Uh, so I don't want to share who that, this person is, but I think we're, we're getting there. And I want to thank Justin for that. Um, if anybody else is interested in having guest speakers speak, speak on any individual topic, you know, please feel free to recruit them, but give me plenty of heads up. Don't just bring them along with you to a meeting because you know these agendas are packed. Um, and then I also shared with you all the glossary of terms uh, that we, we talked about how we need it. It's in a spreadsheet format on Teams. Priscilla, did you have a question? January 5th, is that something that just a small group is coming? Yeah, that's just, if you didn't receive an email about January 5th, you're not okay. involved in that. Because, you know, I, I, I gave different groups of the task force to help me with different panels and, and focus groups. So if you didn't receive anything about that, you're okay. good. Um, so I sent that glossary of terms. That's just the initial version. We're going to continue to build that, but I encourage you to add term. Even if you just, you don't want to add the definition, you just know we need to define that term. Go ahead and add it to the spreadsheet and we'll do it and, and add it to that. Okay. Thanks Joe for getting those things rolling because this is going to continue to be this under construction process. <laughs> we keep just adding. It'll make life so much easier as we get towards the deadline to have those happening as we go and if you think of other things like that that we can just start framing let us know um so we're not crunched at the end that would be great so i sent last week the the meeting notes from the last meeting thank you to andrew for compiling those for us uh, i also sent you our draft preliminary whatever you want to call them recommendations if you look in that document i sent you we're going to be building that as secretary Flora mentioned as we go 
Uh, so I did want to have a brief discussion today to make sure we captured those correctly. Now, I don't have them all on this screen because that would be, it was a lot of language, but this, for those who are joining virtually, if you click on the link up here, the preliminary zone use and approval recommendations, that will take you to that document on our website. I've also shared it with all of you all, so you should have it. Uh, but I do have some summaries here that we can go over this. Also, the 1128-23 meeting notes, there's a link to those as well. Um, so I broke it up into local government, state government, and best practices. Now, there's obviously always going to be a little bit of gray area between what is a recommendation versus a best practice. Uh, but Chuck helped uh, me with some ideas on how to structure those. So hopefully uh, I've hit the mark. But if you all think differently, please do. The, uh, the document I shared with you as well, we can, you all can add notes to it if you want to communicate with me. So there's a clear preference for by right approval processes, right? We talked about by right versus special exception last time. That was repeatedly stated over and over again. So that's, that's kind of a, a, an umbrella recommendation over top of this category. Um, and when you get to the details, they should define and permit at least one ADU by right in those single family residential zones. Right? There's some more variety if you go look at the actual document I created uh, based on context. Uh, this works for both state government and local governments that what, when we're communicating about ADUs, when we're creating policies, recommendations, suggestions, it should be clear, simple, straightforward, because we're, you know, we're not dealing with big time developers often. We're, we're deal, dealing with homeowners, right? And they, you know, that's not what they do for a living. So it should be clear, straightforward, and get to the point. Uh, but there should also be some wiggle room with approval processes and standards based on unique community and neighborhood context. So that's the general summary of local governments. Now for state government, uh, there, the umbrella concept here was that there'd be no state mandates about requiring this, uh, requiring a lot of the things we're suggesting here. That was mentioned a couple of times. Um, however, uh, there's still a strong role for the state to play in this. Reinforce and provide tools to implement local ADU by right approval processes. Right, again, that clear and straightforward ADU guidance. Like we're recommending by right, and here's how you can do it. Um, so, uh, and then uh, create the different varieties of guidance, including a flow ch chart on how these by right standards and approval processes can work and have them targeted on single family residential uses. And then for best practices, it's definitely being context sensitive, specific, and unique to the individual jurisdictions. The discussion of avoiding redundancy that we have a lot of zoning requirements, ordinance requirements from the state and local that may uh, they be them environmental or the specific examples of critical areas that they may already address a lot of the concerns the community may have about where an ADU is situated, environmental preservation, other concerns. And we should not pile on more of those requirements in our approval processes or for the ADUs, um, that we should limit special exception ADU approval to areas clear objectives requiring more oversight. This would be historic preservation areas areas that have very specific, measurable environmental constraints. So by right, again, overall recommendation of by right, special exception, it can be considered, but only in areas where it is very clear what you're trying to preserve or that there needs to be more uh, oversight. Um, there should be some flexibility basis based on eternal and attached versus detached ADUs. That's another one of the context sensitive things. So we're gonna see some of that today uh, when we look at lot requirements that oftentimes lot requirements are distinguished by internal or attached versus detached ADUs. Uh, best practice is always objective approval standards, things that can be measurable as opposed to subjective criteria, like adverse impacts on a community, those things that allow for more of, you know, somebody just that it doesn't feel right, right? Or you know, the public comes out in a large outcry against it. So we wanna focus on the objective uh, approval standards and that best practices will vary by community type. And I have some examples that I included in the best practices section of the document I sent you to kind of break this down. So uh, before we go any further, we get into our panel discussion and I, I, I want to thank our panel for waiting patiently and joining us today. Um, are there, is there any thoughts on either the draft preliminary recommendations that I sent you or the notes that you would like to change or can, Discuss. And, you'll, and you'll, you'll have to forgive me because I, I missed, I was online, which is not the most ideal for me. And then I missed part of it because I was at a medical appointment. What kind of discussion, what kind of discussion 
do we have around, you know, it's nice to say that we want it to be by right, mm -hmm. but for certain communities, and I will just say like the city of Westminster, we have a lot of water and sewer capacity issues. So the idea that we would allow ADUs by right across the board, I would imagine would give a lot of heartburn uh, because of the water and sewer capacity issues. So what kind of, because it's nice to say, well, hey, ideally it should be by right, but realistically when you're dealing with, you know, certain, and, and we're limited, our water and sewer capacity issues, quite frankly, are very much, you know, limited by the Maryland Department of the Environment. So, well, you know, I, 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 it's not like I can, what my opinion might be, might be different than what the Maryland Department of the Environment is gonna be. Um, and and they're gonna be conservative because they do, when you have a drop light situation, which we have right now this year, um, get very concerned because you don't want a municipality be trucking in water, you know, or, you know, so what, your, your how does question, that interrelate? You no, know, your question's very good. And it's, it, it's reminding me that I should have prompted my description of this a little bit better. So we're building these recommendations in pieces. So, um, the recommendations are very specific to just the topic last week. We're going to be talking about utilities and that and water and sewer connections and capacity the February meeting or is it the March meeting? And uh, so, you know, we're starting with this. And then as we enter new topics or as we talk about new topics and we develop new nuanced recommendations, those will impact and, and modify the ones, right? So, and I should have said that. So if you look at the recommendations I sent you, there's a couple things I added in there about design or other topics that are not specific to special exception versus by right, just to help illustrate a point, but they're really focused on just that. Um, so there will be room for them to grow. This was, this is in a mirror or a mirror in a bubble. Like we're considering by right or special exceptions kind of in a bubble with these recommendations without these other things that we know that they're factors which we haven't fully addressed. So we will get back to that discussion. Okay. Yeah, I think the other thing to keep in mind with by right, it just means we don't need a big public hearing yeah. planning commission. They're still gonna have to be zoning administrator. Sure. Yes. Objective and standards. Do, and it still has to meet all the technical requirements. It's just, does everyone need a public hearing or a planning commission? Because you can limit it yeah. based on capacity issues. Exactly. That can all be part of the zoning administrator's review. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. But mm -hmm. yeah, but it's a good question. We do need those clarifications. Um, other questions or clarifications or something that maybe you feel is misrepresented from our discussion? All right. Anything online? We all good online? Okay. Um, yeah, any anybody who's joined virtually up? Any of the task force members? Okay. okay, keep it in mind, this is draft. We're gonna keep building on it. Doesn't mean we can't circle back, but we really wanna make sure we're kind of all rowing in the same direction right now. So um, so I think we're, we're good. Moving. Okay, good well, now we are ready for the panel discussion. So we're going, we have some guests here. They're gonna have a chance to yeah, have some, have a half online, half here in person. We're gonna clear out this area. Uh, we got Eric, I haven't met everybody. Jason, Lynn, all right, I was right. You all can move here, and then we got some more online. Um, and Kathy, Mar, you were my, I'm glad I had yes. you as a backup because somebody didn't show up. So you have been promoted to the first team. Kathy, sorry, that person just showed up. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, of course, I, exactly as I said that, Kathy, I'm sorry. Welcome, Phyllis. Yeah, having uh, some technical difficulties. Okay, buddy. Okay. Okay. Uh, if I could ask uh, Ashley and Tim to make sure that you're. <laughs> Good plan. Oh, yeah. Okay, we did it. This company doesn't Okay, so I want to uh, thank the audience's patience as we try to do a hybrid panel discussion. 
uh, keep on doing this to myself and adding complications to these meetings, and uh, they don't always work, uh, but we're going to try. Uh, so I don't know how the visual is going to work, but I'm going to have uh, the panel members introduce themselves. Uh, this was a request of the, the task force a couple meetings ago to have a, a panel discussion input from uh, planning directors or their designees for jurisdictions that have an ADU ordinance. Uh, have implemented it and to give us some feedback because these are the folks that are on the ground uh, dealing with this on a day to day basis. I'm going to start with those in the room to introduce themselves, maybe a sentence or two about ADUs in your community. Your thoughts, uh, Mr. Sartles. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so, good morning. I'm Jason Sartori, and thank you. I'm with uh, the Montgomery County Planning Department. I'm the planning director there. And uh, I, just one quick recommendation for Secretary <laughs> Flora, maybe. We might want to see if we could find uh, Joe a tall chair or something so he doesn't have to stand for the whole meeting. Um, I would just get out of the chair. <laughs> um, so I would say one big, big, big thing about uh, ADUs in Montgomery County, our approach has been somewhat incremental uh, in terms of our, the changes that we've made to loosen the restrictions on ADUs. It's taken uh, place over time and to, to get to where we are today. Uh, not to say that we can't do more. Uh, it's just, it, it, it was, it's been much more palatable to do things in an incremental way. Hey, I'm Lynn Miller. I'm a deputy director with Anne Arundel County's Office of Planning and Zoning. And um, let's see, we've had allowances for ADUs in our zoning ordinance for many years, um, but it was fairly restrictive. It was um, only allowed um, internal to the principal dwelling. There was a fairly large minimum lot size of 14,000 square feet. It had to be owner occupied. So um, unlike Montgomery County, we haven't really done an incremental change. We just did one big change earlier this year in the spring. We completely redid that ordinance and um, opened it up a lot to allow, um, you know, we can get into that detail later, but it's much more uh, flexible but it's new it just passed earlier this year so it's going to take us some time to see how the real estate market and property owners um, choose to to use this hey everyone um, eric lashinsky city of annapolis i'm the chief of comprehensive planning um, <clears throat> somewhat similar to lynn's uh, situation in the county we we had accessory dwelling units were allowed in some in some zoning districts, but we passed a, a bill in October of 2021 that allowed for a by right um, ADU in any uh, in any residential lot in the city. And there's standards associated with it, of course, but um, it has not led to a, a windfall of ADUs. Um, teaser alert, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it's 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 one tool we have now and. I mean, they, there's some circumstances in Annapolis that I'll talk about later that um, they make it maybe less effective than some other places. But um, the standards, I, I would say, um, are important. And I think um, somewhat to my surprise, we, we did not um, have a parking um, requirement, um, which I thought was, was a good thing, but that was a, that was a hot topic. So, um, you know, Happy to share what we've learned so far in the couple of years that we had it on the books. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go to those online. We'll start with Ashley. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Ashley Moore, senior planner with Frederick County. Um, in regards to our ADUs, like we've had our ordinance for some time now. Um, the last amendment was maybe a couple years ago where we increased the allowable square footage to be reviewed at a staff level. Um, but overall, we didn't see any significant pushback on ADUs. Um, it might have been a bit biased because those who who wanted to build, you know, ADUs or, or the builders who actually constructed are the ones that are going to turn out for these amendments to the legislation. So, um, but overall, it's been um, pretty welcome here. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Phyllis? Good morning, everyone. My apologies again for being late. Um, we've had accessory apartments as dwelling units in addition to primary residence since 2018. We've only issued two permits. I thought there'd be a lot more because we've gotten an increase in um, a lot of inquiries about 
families want to moving their in-laws in or having their college students move back in. Um, we do want to look at in next this in 2024, we're in a comprehensive rezoning phase right now, but in 2024, we're going to be updating our code. So I'm really interested to see what Anne Arundel County has done and what everyone here um, at, in the task force has to say about increasing that. I love the tiny home concept, um, especially the one that's shown here. There's been a lot of um, acceptance from our city council and our mayor to look at expanding accessory uses um, on primary lots for residential dwellings and residential zoning. So interested to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Tim. Morning, everybody. I'm Tim Borsier, Director of Planning and Haver de Grace. Uh, we had just, we had cottage dwellings in our code, um, but we didn't specifically talk about all the different types of ADUs. So earlier this year, we just adopted a new set of rules around accessory dwelling units. Um, and part of that um, motivation was that we started getting a lot of accessory dwelling unit applications that weren't really accessory to the to the main structure. So we were getting some some monstrosity buildings, garages, uh, additions to homes that were about the size of the home that they were sort of sneaking in under um, our old rules. And so uh, we we used a model from um, uh, Chevy Chase, where Chevy Chase, Maryland, where we um, try to make the requirements proportionate to the the lot, the home, and that sort of thing to keep the character of the neighborhood, but still to allow those things. So um, we've, yeah, we just revised ours recently. Um, I said, we end up setting on the, after a bunch of research, setting, setting on this Chevy Chase model, but our, our focus was really to make sure that, that these were accessory dwelling units, that they weren't um, a second house on, on a lot. Um, and that we were able to try to maintain the character of the neighborhood uh, as it's kind of historically grown uh, organically. So um, that's it for me for now. Thank you, Tim. And Kathy, please do introduce yourself. I, I know that uh, you are you are my backup, but I'm glad to have you here, Kathy. We'll have time for, time for you to contribute as well. So go ahead. Hello, I'm the Director of Planning and Code Administration for the City of Hagerstown. We do not have an accessory dwelling unit ordinance, but we have a boatload of properties that had apartments put into them in the past. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I think there definitely be opportunities for you to contribute, especially because you're the one without an AD ordinance, but you you sent us a lot of comments uh, and you thought about this a lot in Hagerstown, even if you do not have one. So that is just as valuable input as well, especially because a lot of the jurisdictions in the state don't have one. Um, so as a reminder, before we get into the questions to the task force mostly, um, a lot of these early questions are from this contributing to our housing market analysis, which is one of the requirements of the task force. Um, we're still trying to finalize this intern um, from University of Maryland next spring. It's going to happen. That can do some of the more, uh, some of the quantitative uh, research, look at what's been described out there. But for, remember, through each of the focus groups and the panel discussions, we're going to try to build some of those components of the housing market analysis. Um, so some of the early questions related to that, some of the later questions are more specific to like the practical issues that other things are supposed to, to uh, discuss. Okay, so I sent these questions ahead of time. I hope you all uh, had some opportunities to look at them. Um, and I signed a couple of them to individuals because we are, we're limited in time, but we'll see where the conversation goes. Uh, if, if we don't have to be so limited to, to the questions, but hopefully it sparks some, some thoughts. So the first question is for everyone. Uh, what has the local government experience taught us about ADUs and the housing market? What prevents them from being a viable housing product? Conversely, what facilitates them as one? We'll go through in the same way we, we started. So we'll start with you, Jason. Sure. So I would say in Montgomery County, I think what, one of the things that's just kind of a natural attribute of the ADUs being smaller units is something that kind of makes them attractive and uh, facilitates them as as, as as, as viable options in, in Montgomery County. Um, certainly uh, the efforts that we undertook to ease the zoning restrictions uh, have helped as well. Uh, we've seen a, a doubling of the number of ADUs that we get each year. It's not an, an immense number, right? We went from 50 to 60 new ADUs per year before uh, our most recent change in 2019 to now we're seeing about 120 new ones per year. Um, 
But I would say some, one of the, 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 the kind of the, the complications that we're seeing, things that are preventing them, there are a couple of things that I, I thought about with this that we're hearing a lot. Uh, first is that upfront costs are pretty are pretty high for individual homeowners, and so uh, and access to financing to be able to to, to do that, uh, especially now uh, with high interest rates, and so that that's certainly an obstacle that we're hearing about. Uh, the other is. Um, HOA restrictions that prevent, uh, we have a, a, a large portion of our county that is covered by HOAs and many of them still have restrictions that prevent ADUs. And so that's uh, certainly another thing that we see as an obstacle. Same question to you, Lynn. I'm happy to repeat if you like. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, again, because our, well, we, we do have a number of ADUs um, internal to the principal structures that have been in place for a while. But as I said earlier, our update for months, which we think is going to generate a lot more interest, only passed, I think, in April or May this year. So it's fairly new. And our inspections and permits department has only had a handful of permits and detached ADUs since that passed. But when we were going through the legislative process, we had um, a lot of positive testimony. Actually, surprisingly, we were a little concerned that there might be a fair amount of opposition um, as well as some support. We did not hear a lot of opposition from the public in general, um, and we heard a lot of support. So we do think that there's going to be strong interest, particularly in the detached ADU model. We've had a lot of calls from constituents and builders since that legislation passed. Um, from people who are interested in trying to build with detached ADUs. So we think that because it's new, the, the market and the building industry are sort of just now kind of figuring out how to make it work in the county, but we think that it, it probably will. Um, one thing that um, I think is, is we've had a number of calls actually from people, property owners who are outside of our planned utility um, service area, so people who are on private well and septic, I think that is going to be a constraining factor and there's not a lot we can do about that. You know, there's certain uh, requirements for septic and for reserve areas and some of the property owners who contacted us and who were very interested in this idea of the detached ADU, I think have found out that it's not really going to be viable for them on their property because of the well and septic requirements. So that's one thing that's somewhat out of our control, but um, I think that there is going to be a strong interest. We had a similar concern um, that we also can't control as Montgomery County did in that being a large county, we have a lot of communities that are HOAs. Some of them do have limiting covenants that are sort of restrictive in terms of ADUs. Some don't. You know, it's possible that some may start to adopt those kind of limitations into their HOA covenants now that they know this bill is passed. We haven't heard a lot about that yet, so we're hoping that won't happen. Um, so. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I just want to correct the record of something I said before um, I misspoke. We actually did not allow ADUs at all prior to our bill in 2020. I mean, a lot of sort of grandfathered ADUs that were built, you know, um, non-conforming over the years. Um, so we actually try to bring those in from the cold a bit, you know, uh, get them uh, to be conforming to our, our zoning code today. But um, uh, we, we passed our bill in 2021. It applied to all residential districts. And so that was a pretty big deal, kind of going from zero to 60 in a way. Um, so, so suddenly, but... Um, it, it is a viable housing product, you know, for Annapolis. I think the scale of it is very appropriate to the context of Annapolis. But, um, but the issues that we've had, I, I think, are more about um, the fact that well, I mentioned the S word, the short-term rental um, market is, is thriving in Annapolis. And that was something that was allowed within our ADU ordinance. Um, I think it was probably key to it getting passed. And so um, it's very challenging in a kind of thriving tourism market to ensure that the ADU becomes a standard rental or a long-term rental. I think um, the, the profit potential for an ADU in Annapolis is much higher 
if it's a short-term rental. And so I think somebody who's uh, investing in, in that type of product for their properties is going to be thinking about that. And um, similar to Jason mentioned, the, the upfront costs are, are pretty significant. And so that's something we've become aware of and, and thinking about how to change the policy. But, um, you know, a typical homeowner is going to be putting uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in fees up front into just getting the ADU uh, legal, you know, essentially capital facilities fees, a separate water meter, rental license fees. So uh, that's something we're looking at. You know, just just sort of try to incentivize a standard rental, maybe. But um, I guess the last thing I'll say, you know, there's a I think now that it's, it's sort of officially on the books, I mean, I be personally have become more aware there's a kind of a spectrum of ADUs where I think common discussion, we talk about, we, everybody thinks about it as sort of the, the, the sort of detached granny flat, um, could be rented out to somebody long-term, but there's a ton, there are a ton of ADUs in Annapolis that aren't really providing that, you know, they're, they're somewhere in between, you know, they're, it might just be a bedroom and a bathroom and they don't have a really a full kitchen and some are the full package, you know, and there's this wide spectrum and we kind of have to, we're kind of getting to maybe some, some, some questions here, but think of what you're trying to achieve, you know, what is the end goal for the, this, as a housing product is really important to the, I think we're not, necessarily getting that full product in, in many cases. So thank you. All right, we'll go to those joined virtually. Ashley, same question to you. It's on the screen. Remember that I actually had the questions. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, what prevents it from being a viable housing product? Um, a lot of things we see, but a lot of people don't want to go through the process. Um, they, they feel like they should be able to finish their basement and, and, add a full-blown kitchen and, and call it a day. Um, so there's that. And then there's also, like it's been previously mentioned, the upfront cost, like you got to go through design, you got to go through permitting before you even put anything into the ground. Um, so that turns people away once they see, you know, how deep this project, you know, could go. Um, sometimes you, you can put a lot of money into it. If you don't budget correctly, then you've got a half-finished job. Um, and in those instances, you know, people give up on that and other people come into the situation, then they've got to do some conversions and that it could be more costly than starting, starting all over. Um, so there are those struggles, um, but what makes them a good one, I would say, you know, if you have that experience, it, it could be a pretty neat do-it-yourself kind of project if you have that experience. Um, and I've seen some some jurisdictions where they do streamline the process if there's a kind of pre-approved design, um, you know, we're comfortable with staff approving this because it's been tried and true. Um, so I think there's ways we could um, make it more palatable for people to, to go that route. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs> You said be brief. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. And what I've heard so far is, is bringing to my mind, like, you know, I, I know I laid out the research plan and the topics we're going to be focusing on over the next three or four months. And they're really, we're talking about a lot of what we're talking about is ordinance design, but a lot of what I'm hearing, and I, you see this in the public comments as well, is a lot about the process. It's a lot about the financing. It's a lot about providing that assistance to people that want to do these. So I, I think maybe that's particularly relevant to the housing market analysis that we need to do, but also just I think we should keep that in mind. It's not all a perfectly organized, a perfectly designed ordinance. It's not going to lead to what you want. Um, there's that, that other component as well. Anyway, sorry, I, I'm going to try to keep my editorials to a minimum. But thank you all. Uh, Phyllis, same question to you. So we're trying to encourage um, this type of unit in our older areas of Aberdeen, uh, where they have very large lots and there's adequate room there to put an accessory dwelling. Um, the issue with that is, and it has been, um, it's really come to light recently, is affordability. Um, our Department of Public Works will require 
um, the homeowner to put in a new line if it's aging, you know, a lot of our infrastructure is aging. So it is really cost prohibitive for a lot of these folks who want to put in a dwell an accessory dwelling unit um, in the rear yard to extend those public facilities. Not only that, but then they have to pay the connection charges, which are, right now they're seventeen five. Um, they're, they're almost twenty thousand dollars, including the meter. So it's very cost prohibitive. And in our newer residential developments, the HOAs just flat out will not permit them at all. It has to be an addition and it has to go through the process, um, through the HOA approval process. Not only that in the building permit process, but it's really been cost prohibitive for families that have inquired about it. Um, it's that water and sewer connection charge that's really been restrictive in Aberdeen. I think they are a great viable housing product, though. We'd love to see them here. It's just convincing our Department of Public Works that maybe we need to cut that fee back um, so that we can allow these uses in the older sections of Aberdeen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm Phyllis is uh, right next door to me, so we're we're uh, we're neighbors. We uh, we hung out yesterday to talk about another project, and we have the exact same issue. So our our capital cost recovery fees, which are um, our term for for the water and sewer um, connection fees, are eighteen thousand five hundred. So we're at twenty thousand also. But um, I'll say this to answer the first question. So what what I've learned about ADUs um, in the time that I've been here is when the housing market is hot and people are building, these costs don't seem to matter to people too much. They seem to build. We we haven't had a lot of phone calls in town where people say, hey, I want to build an accessory dwelling unit. And we tell them the costs. And then they say, oh, okay, that's too much for me. I'm going to back off. Like that that just hasn't happened in, in my experience here yet. But what, what has happened is when we have a, a when our permits are are going big, there's definitely a correlation where people are coming in and and uh, building garages, garage apartments, additions, and um, those maybe detached accessory dwelling units. I mean, if 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 the if that's sort of where the market is going, then then these things are sort of moving forward. When interest rates started to raise and and um, and inflation was really hitting in in the last year, we just weren't getting phone calls about any of this stuff, but we also had a, a little bit of a drop in renovation permits and that sort of thing. So um, that's what I would say about the housing market. Um, what prevents them from being a viable housing product? Um, I, I'm, I mean, I'll just reflect what Phyllis says, but I think one thing I, I would add is that I think there's like a bit of a lack of clarity of what an accessory dwelling unit is. Is it you know, a place where like your your in-laws or like your your kid after college comes and moves in and there's not a kitchen facility, you know, they're using the main house for a lot of things, but they kind of have this separate place where they sleep. Is it a commercial venture where you, you kind of have this smaller place that you're renting out or are you trying to maybe make some extra money as a short-term rental? Uh, so you have that as an option. And I, I think, and somebody mentioned in the chat this, um, that there's a lack of marketing. Uh, I don't know if I would exactly put it put it that way, but if you were going to market accessory dwelling units, I don't know that you can really tell people clearly like what it what its purpose is, what's its good use, and and I think that's really where like maybe we're we're missing some some direction is is on on how how accessory dwelling units should be should be used. I mean that we here locally we think they should be um accessory to the main use they should be smaller there shouldn't be two you know dwelling units on one lot so it should be smaller but we do allow uh kitchen facilities and that sort of thing uh we do allow um we do allow them to be used as short-term rentals but we do require that the owner live on the property uh that they occupy one of the two dwelling units so um i i, I don't i mean i, I think that works for us in town, but I, I can see why that would be sort of confusing. If you were going to build an accessory dwelling unit, you'd have to really think about who it was for, what you were trying to, what you were trying to to do, and then how much sense does does that does that make? Is it is it too expensive just to have you know your your kid or in laws living for free, or does it need to be a commercial venture because of the the expense? 
you got to make your money back on it. So, um, yeah, just a thought um, on that. Uh, what facilitates them as one? Um, I, I think I think there's there's obviously a need out there. We there's a demand for for housing um, for for family moving back home uh, to be close to family. Um, I I think I think there just is a market for. Um, lower cost housing and middle middle cost housing. And I, I think just the size of accessory dwelling units makes it um, something that 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 is attractive to people who are looking for that type of housing. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Kathy, I think we're doing pretty good on time. Do you have any thoughts on this question? It's okay if you don't. But... Sorry, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Uh, as you know, I have tons of thoughts on this topic. Yes, I know that, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> and Hagerstown was an industrial city when it when it developed in the late 19th century, early 20th century. We have tons of working class neighborhoods of that era that were built with accessory dwelling unit properties and that there are two family homes. One side was owner occupied, the other side was rented. And as time went by, they became both rented or subdivided thinking they might be owner occupied on each side, but then they both became rented. And uh, townhouses, small townhouses in these same neighborhoods subdivided into two to three units. And as a result, over time, we have we have a very aggressive investor community in Hagerstown. We are at 60% renter occupied for all of our housing units, which is a reverse of what the statewide average is. And so some of our neighborhoods are already too crowded because of this activity where it's more people and cars than the, the neighborhood was built for. So it, for people who have a choice of where to live, these neighborhoods are no longer considered desirable. And if you, if this was gonna happen, it would probably end up happening in those neighborhoods where it's larger single family detached homes. And people might think that it's gonna be an owner who thinks I'm gonna put in a little unit so my family can live there, or you know I can have a little bit of income to, to live in place. But really, I think the only people that would be interested in this, if we said you can put an accessory dwelling unit in an existing single family home, it's going to be the investors because then they're going to they're going to rent two units. You're not going to have an owner occupied and an accessory. And the other factor is it's not going to be affordable either because our rents here are ridiculously high compared to the income of the folks that live in these units. And so to me, it's at least for our community, it would kind of backfire for what is intended by this effort. All I got. Uh, the next question is a follow up. This is open to anybody who would like to respond. I don't think we have time for everybody to respond, but if anybody has any uh, specific thoughts, uh, some of this has already been touched on a little bit, uh, but this is specific to ordinance design, kind of one of our main topics. But specifically, how have requirements on parking, setbacks, square footage, and height impacted the development of ADs in your community? So when you see those that have or haven't been developed, the proliferation or the lack thereof, how have these components? specifically impacted this is tim I'll, I'll just hop in real quick we haven't had issues with any of these things except for parking and i wouldn't say that that's an issue but that gives the most heartburn we require one additional space usually if somebody has a two-car garage and two places in the driveway it's not a problem but there's been a couple situations where like ah oh, we have to put in one spot somewhere we also have a lot of riverfront in the critical area so um creating impervious or uh, pervious space is an issue or impervious space, sorry. So um, I would say that that hasn't prevented anybody, but that's been the one thing that's caused the most heartburn here. Tim? I'd say it's in Annapolis, it's not really an issue. None of these are really an issue either. Uh, they were big hot topics when the ordinance was being um, discussed at the council and, and uh, that whole process. I mean, they were, you know, parking was kind of like third rail topic, but. Um, Think that the sort of cooler heads prevailed on that and, and um, you know recognizing that it would not in most cases it's not going to have a dent into uh, the, the impact on the neighborhood um, yeah so yeah that's just not those aren't really de deciding anything any other thoughts from the group I, I would, I would agree William. For, for Hagerstown, we allow duplexes in any residential zoning district, but there's a maximum or a minimum square footage for the lot size you have to have to add the second unit. So that that um, 
that is a stumbling block for some people who want to add a second unit. The other thing is it is very expensive to add a second unit because it's the, the new unit has to be brought up to code, fire separation, sprinklers, all that kind of stuff. So those are two main stumbling blocks that we have. Kathy? Ben? Um, I was just agreeing that I don't think these particular requirements have been an issue for us today. Parking probably would have been the big one, but um, both in our older ordinance and our new ordinance this year, we don't require a parking space for ADUs. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next question, which is specific for Eric and Lynn, but if we have enough time, others can chime in. Um, what is the interplay of policy or ordinance changes and market demand on the proliferation of ADUs? How do they impact each other? Do certain policies or ordinance work better in certain types of communities? So I'll let you all fight over who gets the code first. Uh, I, can, I can take this first stab. I mean, I, I mentioned it already, the issue of tourism and, and the um, growth of the short-term rental market in Annapolis is definitely something that is impacting the, the use and viability of the ADU. And, and so I think the, the original intent of our ordinance was to provide for more standard rental, long-term rental, housing supply needs. And you know, I think um, it's not really doing that yet. So to the degree that we want it to, that we want to use the ADU as a tool for long-term housing supply, we need to tweak our requirements or standards for the ADUs to really um, aim for that market. I think so incentives, fee reductions, um, uh, anything, you know, any kind of expedited process, anything that we can do to make it easier for a typical, like you mentioned at the beginning, we're not dealing with um, seasoned developers here. We're, to, you know, these are homeowners that may not be familiar with the process. So anything we can do to, to make it easier for them to create the, the longer term rental is needed. Um, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's kind of the primary issue. Oh, we also have a, I would say we have a shortage of certain lodging types. And so that's why the short, short term rental has proliferated, I think, in Annapolis, um, in, uh, downtown area in particular. So. I think it's interesting that you said that short term rentals are one of the selling points when you were going through it. And I, I feel like a lot of people would, that would not be the selling point. That would be what everybody's trying to fight. Yeah. Different community. But I mean, that tells you the difference. We're talking about the certain policies or ordinances work better in certain communities. I mean, we have a pretty active short term rental community that lobbies hard, you know, when, um, when there's an opportunity or a risk to those. And so I think that that's why they, I think that that aspect was, was really key to the bill getting passed originally um, as a profit. Mm -hmm. um, potential. So, yeah, it's, um, I mean, short term rentals aren't, they're certainly not universally popular in Annapolis. I, I don't want to um, convey that, but um, there's just a very vocal community of, of home owner occupied short term rental owners that I think are really seeing it as a you know, way to supplement their income. So, um, let's see. Well, so again, we, it's, a little, I could probably speak better to this question a couple of years from now after our new ordinance has been in place and we kind of see how that mm -hmm. interacts with the market. Again, we do think the market demand is there. We've only done this one sort of big update to our ADU ordinance earlier this year. Um, so we're going to see how that plays out. Um, one of the, you know, a couple of things we did, um, we are, Again, we're hearing a lot of interest. We're also hearing concern about the cost. A couple of things we did was um, in our ordinance, we waived the capital facility connection charges um, for an ADU. Um, our public works department does prefer that the ADU just hook up to the existing connection, but there may be cases, particularly with a detached ADU model, where the property owner may want to extend a new connection. So that may be possible. Um, and so we did, for those cases, waive the capital facility connection charges. We also waived impact fees for ADUs. Um, 
unless the ADU is constructed by a builder at the same time as the principal dwelling. I don't know how often that would happen, but if a property owner bought an unapproved property and wanted to build a new home plus an ADU at the same time, um, they would have to pay an impact fee on both units. But if the existing, the principal dwelling was already there and the homeowner builds the ADU or adds on the ADU later, there would be no impact fee. So that may help. Um, you know, one of, one of the big cost constraints, I think, may also be sprinklers, but there's also not a lot we can do about that requirement, especially if it's a detached unit. It's going to be required to put in sprinklers. So we've had a lot of interested parties call and, and you know, be kind of concerned about the, the cost of sprinklers. Uh, the short-term rental was probably the biggest policy debate we had when we were working on our legislation. We did end up allowing use for the ADU um, or the principal dwelling as a short-term rental for that matter. Um, same concern that they have in Annapolis if we're trying to meet the objective, you know, the broader objectives of ADUs, um, it's going to meet those objectives better if it's used as a longer term, not just a short term rental investment. Uh, but we don't have quite as much concern as the city does. I mean, there, there is some demand in the county for short term rentals, but I think it's not as large as it probably is in the city. So we felt like there's probably a better chance in the county that property owners, even if they're building it, you know, not for a family member, but it's a rental, that it, there's a better chance that it would be used for a long-term rental, which would help to meet the objective of addressing the housing shortage. So we opted to allow that. There was a little bit of debate at that before the county council, but in the end, I think most people were comfortable with it. And to try to increase that comfort, we do require that one of the two units has to be owner-occupied. Um, if you're using one as a short-term rental. So in other words, you could use the ADU as a short-term rental if the principal dwelling is owned or occupied or vice versa. You could even use the principal dwelling as a short-term rental if the owner lives in the ADU, but the owner has to be in one of the units. That is only a requirement if you're doing a short-term rental in accordance with our definition of short-term rent rentals in our code. So if you're not doing a short-term rental, if you're doing long-term rentals, um, actually both units could be not owner-occupied. So that we thought would increase the viability um, of the product without, it would try to address the fear that some people have that people are going to build these and just, just purely for the purpose of a short-term rental investment property. I want to just uh, piggyback on just something you said that the, for Annapolis, the demand is definitely there. I mean, we, we have um, a very unaffordable housing market. We have a very restrictive zoning code that's just not producing the diversity of housing types to, to serve the diversity of incomes um, in the city that, that we want to have in the city that we need. Um, so, so, so that's the least of the issues. I would say we, we have the demand. We just need to figure out how to provide the, the product that can meet that. Are we going to have a chance for the task force to ask questions? Um, we can at the end. We have some. Questions. Yeah, I want to make sure we reserve some time. I'll reserve some time. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Jason and Tim. Uh, this is the practical issues. This is the phrase. Uh, this is the phrase that's used in the uh, the uh, the bill itself. Uh, so I guess that's a pretty broad perspective or definition. But what practical issues associated with the development of accessory dwelling units on owner occupied land? Zoned for single family residential use. That's the exact language from the bill. Must the task force address? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll begin. Um, so I think uh, the first thing is that, you know, that zoning changes alone are not enough. And um, this has been something that we've now heard repeatedly. Um, you know, the, the concern over uh, HOA restrictions. And I know that um, Majority Leader Moon has a bill that I think he's introduced and that might address this in some way and that might be something to, to, to take a look at or at least should be a discussion that the task force has um, and then also the, the idea of the access to financing right so if there are ways to uh, make that easier for homeowners who are interested in, in going down this path but the other thing that you know we we 
have realized, you know, as we were going through this, and this is no different than really any other policy, especially housing issues. Um, but just, you know, when you think about the, the standards that you can apply that are important to community, or, you know, are the community concerns that you hear. Um, so it's lot coverage, it's setbacks, it's parking requirements, um, you know, all of that. Um, those are all the things that could also make it more really difficult to actually build these. So it's, I think it's important to have a discussion around how do you balance those community concerns with creating a policy that is viable, that actually works. And so in our case, when we looked at parking, uh, we, it, our, in 2019, the bill that was introduced originally had come out saying no parking requirements for ADUs. And there was a, a lot of pushback from the community about that. And ultimately what was adopted was we said, okay, well, within a one mile of a metro, trend, a metro station or a purple line station or a BRT station, you don't have uh, any additional parking requirements for, um, for ADUs. And so, and then one of the things we did was we actually looked at vehicle registrations from the MBA on, um, you know, uh, for housing units within a mile of those types of transit stations. And we found that there was a difference. And uh, also uh, accessory dwelling units within those areas or properties with ADUs uh, only increased, the, the, the vehicle ownership only increased by, I think, 0.3 vehicles per property. So, um, that made, I think, everyone, the community who had concerns and also our council kind of more willing to, to make a change like that, to, to, to not require the parking around uh, those stations. So having conversations around those things, yeah. All right, uh, Tim. Yeah, uh, the, one, well, the first thing I would say was that, you know, before we didn't have zoning in the city until 1982, and I think if you go around town, you see a lot of accessory dwelling units that were built organically without regulations. Then it came sometime um, recently when the housing market was big and there were a lot of uh, demolitions in the city and people building new houses, new people coming to the city. And um, I was saying those accessory dwelling units were um, not really accessory to the main home. So uh, one issue we had where we had to really begin regulating them was to make sure that they actually were accessory dwelling units. Um, so uh, I don't know that that's really affected. Like I said, people aren't really calling and, and asking about accessory dwelling units. And then we're telling them, you know, there's impact fees and it has to be of a certain size and then they, they back away from it. Um, we haven't really had that, that happen. Um, but I would say an issue is making sure that, you know, if, if there's going to be some, if there is some some mandate or, or or required you know requiring requirement that makes us look at accessory dwelling units, I, I think that there really has to be an emphasis that those are accessory. Um, so that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say, uh, just going back to infrastructure, um, you know we have uh, we have water main breaks here all the time because of aging infrastructure. Infrastructure. We're currently um, looking at where lead pipes may be located in town. Uh, we have terracotta pipes in some places where, you know, sewage is, is kind of running through them, but you can kind of poke your finger through them. We just don't have enough money for infrastructure. And and although these may seem uh, small, I mean, every every little thing impacts and taxes the system. And we just don't have the funds to do it. And, and uh, with inflation and everything, I mean, the other option, if we're not, you know, putting these impact fees on to improve the system are raising our water and sewer rates and, and passing this off to our residents who are already, you know, trying to deal with inflation and the different, uh, their, their own economic issues. So that's not really an option either. So if we're going to lower impact fees, there has to be more done and, and provided to, to local governments to help with the infrastructure problems. So we're not, we're not charging these impact fees to try to repair, you know, 50, 70, 80 year old uh, infrastructure that we have on the ground that continues to get beat up by by more and more development. Thank you, Tim. Can All I right. uh, add something to this topic as a practical issue? I don't know if you can address it, but something that the task force should be aware of. Um, certainly having it be owner occupied so there's an accessory dwelling unit is um, a good goal. But what happens when that original owner who created the ADU then sells it to a landlord? 
first off, how does the staff at the city figure that out? That, that's a huge resource. If, and then if you do figure that out, that they're violating this ADU ordinance, what do you now tell them about the ADU? They have to take it out, have to leave it vacant. That That is uh, a future administrative conundrum that the, the locality will face. Happy. All right. Can we have to have time for the task force? Well, I want to make sure that Ash, I'll skip the last question, but okay. I do want to make sure that Ashley and Phyllis can answer the, the specific question I asked them to prepare okay. for, but I'll skip the last question. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this next one is for Ashley and Phyllis. From your experience, how have ADUs, in, from your experience, how have ADUs impacted neighborhood livability and how can ADU policies and regulations be designed to minimize negative impacts on neighborhood livability? Ashley, we'll start with you. Okay, so, um, I mean, we're talking about livability. We're talking about like proximity to things, access to things that are important to people. So um, the way it's impacted us, I mean, it's just a way, it's almost like a slow controlled growth. It's not such a total shock to our system um, when we're getting uh, negative feedback on 400 to 1,000 units up the street, but um, we're getting, like I said, incremental density being added to the system. Um, it's not, like I said, quite a shock to our roads. It's not quite a shock to, you know, possibly schools or water and sewer. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it is more palatable to the community in, in that regard. Now, as far as regulations that could be designed to minimize negative impacts. Um, I mean, we, when it's framed that the ADU is going to be like for a family member or long term long term rental, um, again, it's there's a bit of security in that, and it's more welcome. We don't allow short term rentals, and we, you know, we require uh, owner occupied. They can either live in the ADU or in the principal. So I think there's some safeguards in that to make it a little less transient. Um, and then I would say, um, and I had seen it uh, in one of the previous slides, context sensitive, make sure they're compatible. Um, you know, we allow ADUs in our agricultural and conservation areas, um, as well as our mid to higher density areas. So, um, those that are in, you know, already constructed garages or in basements, you know, those don't need quite the same amount of scrutiny that, you know, a new, a new detached structure would. Like we're, we're seeing detached structures in the agricultural district that are like almost the size of just a regular home in, in a more dense district. So um, I just make sure it's compatible. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Phyllis? So we're really um, supporting uh, ADUs in our trans-oriented development area. We're allowing them a medium density and high density residential, and then we're also allowing them in our TOD area, uh, which is around the train station. And we're really promoting that, and we have been within the past year promoting this through our comprehensive plan update. And when we have public input meetings is to try to hear what the neighborhoods are telling us about, you know, affordability of housing. And um, we're seeing two dynamics in Aberdeen. One side is major growth um, near I-95 and the Ripken Stadium. And it's all high-end housing, uh, single family and apartments. But on the lower end of the city, on the east side of the city, we're not seeing any new residential development at all because we've got major issues with infrastructure. That's where we're trying to support. Um, and we're going to be introducing some code amendments. That's why I was so anxious to hear about what you had to say about Anne Arundel County and Annapolis. Um, because we really want to see some code changes where we... Um, I'm not saying reduce the size of our requirements now, but but at least look at that and present those ideas to the to the public about how can we how can we make this a positive situation instead of a negative impact to the neighborhood. 
Um, and we would really like to see this on the east side of the city around the train station. So we're trying to focus redevelopment efforts around our train station. It's walkable. Um, there's a lot of good infrastructure there now, and that's what we're really trying to promote in Aberdeen is increased densities where we have larger home, larger lots, small single family homes on larger lots um, and really pushing this eight, not pu pushing is not a good word, but recommending that it's a more affordable housing alternative too. Thank you. All right, we'll skip the last question and open it up to task force questions or discussion. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and this is just for who anybody who wants to answer. I would imagine that a good percentage of the new ADU growth that you would have experienced is somehow related to um, family, uh, you know, motivation, like, you know, an aging parent, an aging aunt, or, um, you know, a child, uh, you know, that's maybe in their 20s just starting out. Um, that's what I would imagine. First off, is that true? And then uh, let me just throw out one other quick question. Do your ADU ordinance, ordinances limit the ability, because I think some people will have the concern of uh, ADU being built and then being subdivided later, do most of your ADU ordinance uh, prohibit that, uh, the ability to divide the ADU off as a separate entity later? Those are my two questions, and just whoever wants to comment about that. So in Aberdeen, you can't subdivide them off. Um, and we've also seen a lot of inquiries and the permits that we've issued so far is, is for uh, owner-occupied and if they're moving a family member in. Um, and in the past, they've been aging parents or, um, you know, siblings or other relatives moving into these ADUs. I, in, in Montgomery County, in terms of, I don't think we know exactly who, you know, is living in the ADUs, but I can tell you that anecdotally, that's what we hear as well, right? That it's uh, seniors who want to age in place, it's uh, recent college graduates, just younger couples. Uh, I, I can also tell you that when we've taken a look at one of the issues that we heard as we were going through our uh, change to our policy was about the impact on schools. And anytime we've taken a look at properties that have ADUs and the student generation, we get really accurate student generation data that Montgomery County Public Schools gives us data on the location of every single student in the county. And it allows us to associate that student to a property and a type of unit on that property. And so we can see exactly how many students are coming in our public school system from properties that have ADUs compared to those that don't. And they're identical. So generally that's telling you that you don't have two sets of families living on on those properties with ADUs. It's it, you would imagine that one a family you might have a family living in the the principal dwelling, uh, but the ADU has maybe the owner who's aging in place or a, a young couple or an individual or a set of parents. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. James had his hand up earlier, and now I see more in the right. Yeah, he has a question about who is actually utilizing ADUs. I can't speak for the outer counties, but I will always speak about the urban areas. Most urban areas, as was stated earlier, it's an investment property opportunity. And so regardless of what you think it's going to happen, the reality is someone's going to buy the property. Instead of having one house to rent, I now have two opportunities to sell a home without having any input or increase in funding for city services. And I'm a town administrator. So from my perspective, especially in my town, my town is 52% Hispanic. And while the grandparents or whoever, it sounds like a good idea. It turns out that a lot of the people are either immigrants coming in and they work jobs where they need a service truck, they need a car, they have a daughter, everybody has a car. So parking becomes a really big issue along with city services, trash, increases, right? Those types of things. So to answer your question, to answer it, it sounds great, but it's not the reality. And it's difficult for a town of my size to go around and go knock on the door and find out who's actually living because I technically can't tell you to do that. The flip side is if you do rent an ADU and I'm paying $2,000 a month, you can't tell me how many cars I can have. You can't tell me who can come. If I have a party, you can't tell me that because I'm paying $2,500 to $3,000 a month. 
And if you tell me that, then I might be a little disappointed, if you will, if that makes sense. That's my perspective. So each community is unique unto itself. So that driving your true. community you might not be driving nope. many of the other communities throughout the state. Well, I'm an urban community. Yeah. I'm, I'm a mile from a metro, but I still got to deal with parking. If you're in Garrett County, I'm sure you've got plenty. Yeah, of but things. Annapolis's experience might be yes. different than you. Yeah. That's what my point is, is it's not just urban. Each community is a little bit unto itself. Other questions? Mine is more of a general question. What I'm hearing is very specific things that go to the community and the community needs and the, and the politics, small key politics and big and large politics. So I would be interested to hear from the panelists, if you were to make recommendations to the state, what would they be? Because whatever recommendations this task force were to make, it's going to have to impact the urban community, the rural community, the, where there is a parking issue, no parking issue, where there is a infrastructure issue, utility, sewer, and so it's, I'm, I'm finding it hard to kind of, I'm taking notes and I'm hearing all of these different things and I'm applying it to the counties that I'm familiar with, but I'm just curious to hear what, if you were to get a, a, a policy or, or even a law from the state, what would give you heartburn or what would you say, oh, this isn't going to be a real big issue because we're just hearing so many varying mm -hmm. positions. So I'm just curious. What could have helped? Yeah. yeah. So just, just from your perspective on the panel. I mean, I think, I think anything, any guidance, if, if again, if the goal is to uh, in, increase long-term housing supply, if, if that's a stated goal here, any guidance that could just provide some clarity on what needs to happen to ensure that that is the end product. I mean, I think that uh, like what is based on, I mean, I think every, Participant in the panel is is sharing barriers to to creation of ADUs. You could probably provide some 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 overarching guidance that says, well, more often than not, these if you do these types of things, you're going to have you know standard rentals or long term housing supply. And if you don't, then you're not going to have that. And so I think, but um, you know, getting into parking guidance or um, uh, setback issue. I think that's stuff that is going to be very tricky to navigate just context wise. Um, but I think that's, you know, fees, um, the process that somebody would take to get to a, a permitted project. I mean, that, that stuff I think could all, you know, cut across the board. Um, yeah, I would agree. I, I think if you, you know, there's some, there's some basic requirements that seem to be very commonly used and if you sort of start with those like you know not allowing the ADU to be larger than the principal dwelling I mean that's that's kind of a no-brainer um so those kind of safeguards you know I mean, I mean we opted in our new bill not to have a minimum lot size at all so I think that's something that you could consider because that can be I think overly constraining and in general if you have reasonable coverage and setback requirements, you know, that's going to govern how much of the property itself can be built. So um, I think having, you know, if you are going to allow short-term rentals as an option, um, ensuring that at least one of the dwellings is owner-occupied might be something to consider. Um, because that that seems to be sort of a fear across the board, and whether it's an urban or, or a more rural or suburban jurisdiction, is that uh, somebody's going to have two units on their property and they're going to use them both for short term rentals, and it's just going to be this constant, you know, people coming and going, which would then could start to have neighborhood impact. So there's there's a few of those sort of basic things that I think would really help. Um, you know, another thing you could think about, and we did not elect to do this, but we looked at some examples from around the country from jurisdictions who have, have adopted newer ADU ordinances. And some people are, are opting to use things like architectural standards or even a, a breezeway connection between the two structures um, to sort of help, you know, minimize the appearance of actually having a separate structure on the property. Like one example is in Portland, I think there's 
standards that require the architectural, you know, the materials and the architectural style of the ADU if it's detached to be similar to the principal dwelling and connected by a breezeway so that if you if you look at the property from the street, sometimes it's hard to even tell that there's a second unit on the property. And I, I kind of like that look. We opted not to do that because we were concerned that it might, you know, overly constrain. But there's sort of less commonly used, but a lot of other ideas out there that you could consider if you if you if you're getting caught up in the concern about you know opposition from different types of communities. I, I would add um, I think I do think that it's it's too difficult. There are too many different contexts. Uh, across the state to be able to see standards come from the state about what type of ADU programs you should have or, or how you should have that. Um, but, you know, there are things like, you know, encourage that the programs that would encourage, we talked about financing, but also just uh, investing in communities that have made these changes or where we've seen a number of ADUs take place. And it could even help locals, right? They, where where you know, one of the issues we've had is that we think we know how many ADUs are out there, but we only know how many are licensed. Uh, there are others that have been built when restrictions were greater and that aren't licensed. Well, maybe if there was something that, you know, there was some uh, resource that would be provided to communities that had a certain percentage or certain number of ADUs in the, you know, or density of ADUs, then you get some uh, assistance with some of the things that people are concerned about, water and sewer or and so it might even encourage more people to say, oh, you know what, I'm actually going to go ahead and register this so that we now qualify for this additional. They're just thinking about things that might help invest in the community. Uh, you know, that's always helpful. We don't mind that when the state wants to do stuff. Kind of answered my one question there, but it's, um, I'm just going to throw in two. <laughs> but it, it was how do you enforce you know what what do you have to enforce even even now that there are policies in place not so much the detached which becomes a kind of very obvious somebody's building a new structure but as as individuals might be converting space but then how how do you enforce somebody who just says i'm not going to register this it's going to bring in home improvement contractors and be done for us, unfortunately, I think it's largely complaint driven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very difficult. I mean, yeah. if there's additional cars, I mean, that's one of the few indicators. But even then, I mean, our um, inspections crew, I mean, they, uh, they're limited by what they, it has to be something. The uh, property has to be violating the standards in some okay. way to kind of warrant that kind of inspection. Uh, just to piggyback off of the discussion, because I know we were mentioned existing prior to zoning changes or enforcement coming in a lot of these older structures. Do any of your jurisdictions have resources or methods for homeowners to come in and say, hey, I have this existing ADU in my attic or basement. How do, can I bring it up to code or make sure it's you know, registered with your jurisdiction properly? Not sure if we do. It's a good question. Yeah. We had when our bill was passed, we had a year-long amnesty period that was encouraging non-conforming um, ADUs to, to sort of become conforming and, and pay the rental fee, rental license fees and um, the other uh, fees associated with having an ADU. And I'm not sure we had many takers and, and that has since passed that, that amnesty period. I mean, I think we should probably consider extending it because there's really a very little incentive, I think, to, to do that. So. Mm -hmm. right, one more question, then I'm gonna do a quick round of those online to see if they have any comments. Go ahead. I have a question about financing. I, I understand that if there's an owner-occupied requirement, it's harder to get financing and if you try to sell the house, you know, it, then the, it, they can't get financing because there's an owner occupied requirement for the ADU. Have you run into that or heard about that? I have not. I, I don't think I can speak to that. I got it from Brooks. He okay. told me that that's a big problem. One of our older persons. Um, I can't speak to it either. I, I just, I, 
hence they get into really that um, that aspect of it. And it wasn't part of the discussion when you were passing the bill or anything? I don't think so. I mean, I, mean, I think there was probably, people were probably um, throw it, you know, using rhetoric to kind of say, well, whether these things are going to happen or not, it's going to depend on financing. And that's a big barrier. But I don't think it was really um, based on the extent. You know, but I, I don't know. Um, well, so most of the questions were responded to by the panel members in the audience. So I wanted to give Tim, Phyllis, Ashley, and Kathy any closing words. You can respond to the, the questions, and then we'll wrap up the panel discussion. Um, and I'll go in the order I see. Tim, any closing words, responses? No, I just think uh, thank you guys for for holding this and talking to people that are doing stuff on the ground. I, I think we have a good mix here of of. Um, like Kathy and Phyllis and I, who are, you know, some smaller communities uh, at the municipal level, and then uh, some interesting stuff you guys are are doing at the the county level and more populated areas like Montgomery County. So um, I think it was a good cross section, a good discussion, and um, I, I appreciate being involved as part of the part of the opportunity. Glad you could join, and I thank you for meeting with us months ago in the initial conversation about this, Phyllis. You're muted, Phyllis. I know. I'm trying to. <laughs> sorry, I'm one-handed, so I apologize. It's a little bit slower. Um, no additional comments. I I do appreciate being part of this discussion, and and um, you know, anxious to see what the outcome is. And we have a lot of work to do on our code. Um, like I said, we addressed this back in 2018, but I want to see some code changes next year. So I um. Thank you for being part of this discussion. Welcome. Thank you, Phyllis. Ashley? I was going to add, I mean, but of our part of our ordinances is, um, I mean, it, it's been mentioned before. Um, we only know about the ones that are, you know, properly permitted and approved, you know, but we know there are some out there. Um, we can just check on Airbnb. Um, but I mean, it's it's complaint based, but we do have, you know, as far as trying to keep track of those that we do know about, we do have like an annual statement that the owner has to provide to us. Um, just say, you know, the the conditions that the property or the ADU was approved under is, is still the same. Um, and we have, a, you know, if the lot is sold, then, you know, new ownership or you know, maybe before, before they, officially sell it they have to let us know um so so those are some things that you know we do to kind of keep track of of the adus that are out there um but um overall i think it's a good conversation it's, it's interesting to see what everybody else is doing and um excited to see what's to come thank you ashley and kathy yeah more more debbie downer today but um yeah, we we will keep it. We I've been watching these meetings because we're a little worried about the idea of a state mandate that would just blanketly say every single family home you have to allow an ADU because we have neighborhoods where that that would be overwhelming because they're already fairly overwhelmed with um, density. So um, I don't think my mayor and council will be interested in doing this, but because of the issues I've been sharing that we already experienced, but we have a rental licensing program, so we have a lot of inspectors. We have a lot of scoff law landlords, so we're always out and about observing what's happening with these properties because it's very hard for anyone to sneak in a new unit. What's hard for us to figure out is when things are turning over. But Zillow is a wonderful tool for that. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for agreeing to be back up and then being just ready, like like I said, like you're the first thing all the time. So thank you, Kathy. All right, Secretary Ford, would you like to wrap up the panel discussion or anything before we transition to that? Uh, I just really want to thank everybody. I mean, this has been really valuable and I think um, really appreciate what you've been experiencing on the ground and helping to inform our work because these are, this is tough. I'm, here, I'm hearing conflicting situations where the fees are too high, but to make it work affordably, you got to do the short term and, you know, the parking, I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, are kind of working against each other. So a lot of things for us to consider and just thank you all very much. Um, we're going to take a five minute break. 
and we'll reconvene for the task force. So if you want to catch anybody in those five minutes, you're welcome to. And I hope you'll stay tuned and comment and you see stuff that you feel we could benefit from. Let us know. Thank you. Five minutes, everyone. Thank you, guys. Welcome back. Really As we reposition the room. All right, so the uh, last meeting we talked about uh, zoning use and approval processes, focusing on by right, special exception, objective versus objective conditions or standards versus subjective criteria. Uh, and then today, as described on the research plan, we're going to be looking at lot requirements. Uh, these are the topics we're going to look at today at both at the mayor, based on the Maryland inventory and the, the analysis of other state legislation. Pretty sure all of you are, are familiar with what these are, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but I do want to dig in a little bit on Maryland summarize, and we got things covering the screen everywhere. Move that out of the way. All right, so none of the jurisdiction, oh, and first I want to say we have, uh, I, we have a few examples here of actually the planning directors that were here. They all left now, and at least one planning director who's on the panel. So if I misstate something or I'm, I misinterpreted something in the Maryland inventory, my apologies, but I have the same caveat that I had last time. That I'm showing you examples here that are meant to be illustrative. Uh, and if you really want the details, the unique implications of any of these ordinance requirements, you really need to embed it uh, and live with their ordinances. So these are really for examples. And I apologize, apologize anybody out there if I oversimplify something, just not say it in the exact same way or the right, correct way. It's really to, to spark our discussion. So one of the jurisdictions in our samples that we reviewed had zoning regulations that explicitly required a minimum lot size greater than the underlying zoning classification. However, we'll see an example later in which this was the practical result, even though they didn't explicitly state that. Uh, it's for, for clarity, it helps to specify whether an, an ADU is counted towards the density calculation or not in a, a new residential zoning district, especially in local zoning regulations uh, consistent with state law. Um, for unit size, these are typically calculated as either a minimum or maximum unit size. Uh, in square footage or as a percentage of the principal structure. Often these two measurements are combined, and we'll get some examples uh, about that later. Often local building code requirements also apply, not always. Uh, in terms of lot coverage, this varies. Some codes do not specify lot coverage. Some codes limit all structures on the lot um, to the same as the primary dwelling. Others provide specific numerical limit on lot cover coverage. We did not find any local zoning regulations that limited lot coverage any greater than the underlying single family dwelling unit. Conversely, we did not find any examples where minimum lot coverage was increased to accommodate an AD unit, the uh, AD unit. Running setbacks, typically not more than the primary units and often the same as an accessory structure. Uh, of the local zoning codes we sampled, we did not find any regulations that increase the side or rear setbacks to be greater than that of the primary dwelling unit or accessory structures. However, in some instances, Accessory structures, be the made use or other, did receive reduced setbacks or allowed to be in. Uh, and then heights typically organized by stories, feet, or the percentage of the principal structure. So let's look at some Maryland examples. Uh, as a reminder uh, to the virtual audience and to the task force, uh, this, this presentation, you can access the full inventory uh, here uh, at this link, and this presentation is available on the website. All right, so it's some, it's some Maryland lot size examples. I'm going to tell you this quick. In, in Talbot County, detached ADUs are permitted on lots of one acre or larger if they're on septic. Talk a lot about septic versus sewer today. Or on lots half acre or larger uh, if on public sewer. So you have a modified minimum lot size. Uh, from Ardella Springs, accessory apartments, which they define as internal or accessory building, internal or in accessory building, are only permitted on lots of at least one acre. And theirs is just one acre. Uh, La Plata and Cambridge, uh, an ADU must be located on a lot that is 5,000 square feet or greater. Uh, here's the example that I was talking about earlier, where while they don't say they have a specific minimum lot size for ADUs, it's a practical result. And looking at Cambridge here, let's look at the R district, right? ADUs are permitted by special exception in the R district. Uh, the minimum lot area for an ADU in single family detached is 7,500. And the minimum lot area for single family attached or detached is 7,500, attached is 2,000 square feet. 
So if the minimum lot, if, if, they're, if they have a minimum lot size of 5,000 for an ADU, that means any of these R district SFA units that have a lot size that's under 5,000 because their minimum is 2,000. So in between 2,000 and 5,000, they would not be able to put an ADU on the property. Even though that's not explicitly stated in the, um, in the words. All right, so let's look at density examples. Um, as previously stated, the majority of Maryland ordinances govern ADU density using the density provisions of the underlying zoning district and or by only permitting one ADU per property. You'll see this regularly repeated, one ADU per property. Uh, but in Talbot, they have a specific um, explanation here. An accessory dr drilling unit shall not be included in density calculations for that specific zoning district. Queen Anne's County, I know we got Amy on here, so if I, if I don't say this uh, correctly, I apologize. So one accessory apartment per single family lot and not, but there's not calculated against dwelling unit density, but there are if statements. So if it is within or, or a principal dwelling or an approved residential accessory structure, if that ADU is 1,500 square feet or less, uh, and if it's on septic approved by the county health department, and if the property owner lives in the principal unit. So if it meets all those, all those criteria, it's not calculated towards that density calculation. All right, so let's look at some Maryland unit size examples. I showed, talked about earlier how most of them are done by square footage, uh, percentage of this principal dwelling or combined. So, and, and this is the unit itself, the ADU. So in Sudlersville, the minimum, its minimum is 750 square feet with a maximum of 1,000. East New Market, minimum for internal ADU shall be 500. And then in Baltimore County, 1,200 square feet on a lot greater than one acre and 800 square feet on a lot smaller than one acre. Those are maximum sizes. But then you also see some where they combine them. So a minimum in Elkton, a minimum for internal ADU is 300 square feet, but shall not exceed 30% of the gross floor area. And so you have to meet both of those qualifications. Charles County is very similar, except it did not exceed 50% of the gross flare floor area as well. And then for Snow Hill, the size of an accessory dwelling unit may be no more than 50% of the living area of the principal dwelling or 800 square feet of the floor area, whichever is less. All right, regarding lot coverage, make sure I get to my, all right. Uh, in Montgomery County, it's based on total lot coverage in the underlying zone and the maximum unit size. For Montgomery County, ADUs, uh, the max size for ADUs is 1,200 square feet. And so you have those two things that are be covering the lot coverage possibilities of your ADU. In Frederick City, uh, they specific, they're subject to the impervious surface ratio requirements. Right? So it might not, now I'm not going to calculate it with exact lot coverage percentages or numbers, but they do have an impervious surface ratio requirement. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, when you're deciding how much of your your plot uh, uh, an ADU, particularly a detached or an accessory area, uh, like expansion of the primary unit uh, is taking up. In Rising Sun, the site coverage of the rear secondary residence and the existing accessory buildings shall not exceed 40% of the rear yard. So here they're for specifically talking about lot coverage in relation to the rear yard, not the whole lot itself. Okay, got some uh, setback examples here. Um, so Anne Arundel, this is probably most common uh, across the board. Setbacks, these have to use our setbacks specified for the accessory structure in the mm -hmm. district. It could be garage, any other accessory structure is gonna have the same setback. Crossword gets a little more complicated here. Um, this specifically says accessory structures, which an ADU fits under, shall be set back at least three feet from alley rights of ways or lot lines, except it's increased if for the structure up to six feet in the R1 zoning district, right? So they're really targeted here, the specific zoning district, it's increased to six feet uh, for structures over 100 square feet of floor area. So if, if it's big enough, 100 square feet is not that big, uh, probably any ADU is gonna be over than that. Over than that. Uh, it's going to have to be six feet setback. <laughs> and then this one, I was talking to Chuck about this one yesterday. It seems fairly obvious, but a setback is not required along the same lot line along which buildings such as townhouses are attached. So if you have a you know, row home attached houses in the front, you're not going to increase, you're not going to increase that uh, setback uh, for attached units. 
Uh, obviously, if you're in the middle unit in an attached row, attached line of row homes, you're not going to be able to add anything inside your house. Say you're on the end, end or something. They're not saying you have to have any far, your setback doesn't have to be any greater if you put like an 81 side. Uh, for Chestertown, it's uh, very specific here. No detached accessory building or structure shall be located closer than three feet to a building or property line. So that's saying most accessory buildings have this three feet setback. Except accessory dwelling units. So they call out accessory dwelling units, which must comply with all yard setback requirements height for that prime for the primary structure. So a garage or something like that has three feet setback requirements. But if it's an ADU, it has to be the same setback requirements of the primary structure. All right, uh, for Laytonsville, accessory structures may be located in a side yard or the rear yard. Closer than specified and specified in the minimum minimum yard requirements of the R1 residential zone, but not within five feet of an adjoining property line. All right. So what does this mean? For a conventional lot, I looked at looked at it further at what R1, R1 is requiring. For a conventional lot, the side yard minimum is 20 feet in R1 and the rear yard minimum is 20 feet, 25 feet. Therefore, ADUs can be placed in the side and rear yards in within that 20 feet, 20, 25 feet as long as they are greater than five feet from the neighbor's property, right? So you can, that provides you more flexibility and put an ADU in the side or, or rear yards, but it still has to have that five feet. So they did limit it in that example. All right, so height examples. Union Bridge has uh, two stories for 20 feet in height. Frederick County, um, they cannot exceed 70% of the maximum height allowed for the principal permitted use. That's a that's city a requirement, city. just FYI, Frederick City. That's not did I, did I? Yeah. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to catch me on these. <laughs> so that's Frederick City, not exceeds 70%. For Gaithersburg, the maximum height of an urban cottage, which is how they define ADUs, shall be two and a half stories or 30 feet. Um, so I, I don't know if I mixed up. I have Frederick County and Frederick City on here. So if I mix them up, I apologize. Yeah, that, uh, that the, the Frederick City one that you have might be more more our speed <laughs> with the 80 <laughs> height might not exceed the height of the principal structure yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then for Baltimore City, an existing carriage house um, converted into a dwelling unit cannot be enlarged. So this is both mass, the size of it, and the height uh, to increase the height or footprint by more than 20%. Samples there. Um, okay, so I know I went through a lot of details there, but I wanted, this, this, uh, I think it's important to note, um, you know, last time we did my right special exception, it was a little bit clear cut focused on certain issues. A lot of requirements have a lot, a lot going on, a lot going on. Uh, so before I go any further and I start looking at the state level analysis, I'm going to see if you have any questions or things that people want to discuss. Well, I was just going to make a, a comment that I, I think I believe as a task force, we should not get too much in the weeds here because mm -hmm. my feeling is that context really matters, okay? Like where I am, what zoning I, I'm in. So I think that it, our recommendation should be very much to follow whatever the underlying zoning is as it would apply to, except, you know, if I were building a garage or something like that. Now, obviously, if a certain community wants to make some provisions to loosen that up a little bit for a particular reason. But typically you can go to the BZA if I want to change a setback because I think it's more fitting for a particular technical reason. So you have that avenue already um, because I think it very much depends upon the setting in which you're in and the context of the houses that you're around. You know, even if you're talking about minimum size, you could say, well, you could set a minimum size of five, 500 square feet, and you could set, you know, a maximum side, uh, side I don't know, this is just out of the blue, but a thousand square feet or 50% of the, the primary dwelling, whichever is greater. Because if you have a bigger primary dwelling, you know, you want to, in my humble opinion, you would not want a 1500 square foot accessory dwelling unit when the primary is only 1500 square feet, because it just doesn't feel I think we need to kind of think about context. So there's ways that we could do that via our recommendations, but 
it really depends on the context of what's surrounding it. That's why I think it should be very much tied to the existing underlying zoning when we make a recommendation. That's my humble opinion. I will echo so that um, thought process as well of just looking at this and, and just that we are looking at from the statewide and then certainly counties, <laughs> legislatives, they can be more restrictive of, I, I think there's some benefit of saying certain things such as we, we recognize it's accessory dwelling unit and maybe that overall statement of it shouldn't be larger than the primary and then the local, especially as it gets into setbacks, because setbacks have so much thought process that go into it already. And they're already really covering ADUs, whether they're defined or not. It's it, when it's it, you know an, a separate structure. The one component that is not, it was mentioned briefly by one example, but I think would be very important to look at on a state level is dealing with the impervious surface calculations mm -hmm. in some capacity because that gets into environmental constraints. And as we're facing in Maryland, especially given all the amount of water surrounding us, the Chesapeake Bay and everything, resiliency and what we can do, whether it is just that there's language to look to your local jurisdiction or however that looks, but something that acknowledges you know, we need to take care of our environment. We need to not increase the impervious surface area extensively. So again, very high level language that then needs to come to the local county, local towns to address. I was gonna say, I've done residential work in Anne Arundel County and we have done work with homes that fall within the critical area. Mm -hmm. And the critical area specifically defines when the house was built, what percentage of impervious surfaces can be on the lot. So mm -hmm. it's something already being taken into consideration by local jurisdictions. It could just be something again of like the setback, just an acknowledgement in the statement and then to look local mm -hmm. it is. Just again, promoting that it's been addressed and it's highly important. But yes. Uh, but isn't it just like what we were talking about with historic homes and all that? I mean, if it's in the, the requirements, and I know in Anne Arundel and Annapolis, they have the requirements. If, if it's built in, it doesn't need to be addressed, right? It's just, they can't get a permit for it if it exceeds the, um, the minimum requirement for the critical areas. For, crit for the critical areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's already an overlying. Yeah, I mean, for critical area, but if there are only if the it's a non-critical areas, then it might need to be. Then it's potential. Right. So I think um, I think point well taken. Let's not get too in the weeds because lot coverage can get really crazy. But I think, um, let's look at the state examples because I yeah, think- Deborah has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Deborah. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to key in on that for a second because I completely agree that um, impervious surface is actually a very important topic, not just for environment, but also for aesthetic and uh, many different reasons with, uh, mm -hmm. with on the lot. But um, because Joe, you showed an example earlier of how the ADU in one municipality uh, didn't count toward total, I can't remember the exact, density. not be included the dense, oh, density calculations. But you know, if we get into language like that, then that's, that, that seems a little concerning. The other thing that I keyed in on, just I'm just gonna quickly mention this, but we can move on, is I saw several examples of minimum size requirements and the minimum size requirements would restrict uh, many of the conversations around tiny houses, if that were to be a direction we'd go. Thank you, Deborah. So let's look at what the states, because we wanna to try to understand where the state may have a role. I think these examples you have coming up, Joe, look really good, but I am being mindful of time too. So let's kind of go through these. So just a reminder as well that the other can always access the full table by that link. All right, uh, I'm gonna skip over this one, just mm -hmm. so we're not gonna summarize it since I know we're gonna go from time. Uh, one thing I wanna point out that, you know, I tried to stick to this lower degree to higher degree <laughs> preemption. It's not as easy with lot requirements, we realize, because some of them are maybe more preemptive in one area and less preemptive in the other. It's not as straightforward. 
So I wouldn't, I wouldn't base too much on that. Um, so let's look at New Hampshire here, SB 146. Define, so New Hampshire is unique in that it defines ADUs as internal or attached only by the state legislation. It, it permits, uh, it's permissive in letting a local government uh, have detached, but as its regulations, its requirements are based on, um, on just internal and attached. So it requires them by right with no allowance for increased lot requirements from the underlying zoning. But the bill allows jurisdictions more flexibility if they decide to permit detached ADU. So it's saying you have to permit internal and attached by right, and you can't increase, make, make your lot requirements more restrictive. If you permit detached ADUs, that's your call, and you can make that more restrictive. So next one is Maine. Um, this one requires ADUs to be exempted from density calculations. Uh, internal or attached ADUs must be permitted without more restrictive lot requirements, but jurisdictions are enabled to de develop more permissive lot requirements, right? So this is saying you can't make it more restrictive, but if you want to you know, make your lot size requirements even smaller or even more permissive, you can. So it doesn't, it doesn't force them into one specific thing. Uh, it has a very small minimum size of 190 square feet, and it, uh, it does say that a municipality may impose a maximum size itself. All right, now we got, I didn't have moderate last time, so I, I came up with moderate this time for Connecticut. Um, setbacks, lot size, and buildings frontage shall be the same or less than the principal dwelling. Um, the lot coverage greater than or equal to that, um, and they can require lot coverage greater than or equal to that, which is required for the principal dwelling. I think this one's a little bit inarticulately worded, uh, but what I believe they're getting at here is that, um, um, so, it's essentially, it's the same idea, permissive stuff, permissiveness, you, you know, you can, you can make this stuff more permissive, it's just, it's just worded uh, uh, oddly. Uh, and then also for Connecticut, uh, height also can be restricted, can't be more restricted in the principal dwelling underlying zoning, or cannot be more. So Montana, I classified this as moderate as well. It mandates unit maximum, size maximum for detached and attached ADUs. You can see they did the, it may not be more than 75% um, or 1,000 square feet, whichever is less. So we saw a lot of that. Um, in, in local zoning ordinances. Um, and it prohibits more restrictive lot requirements for ADUs than those in place for the single family dwelling in that, in that uh, zoning district. All right, and then California, uh, it's the only one this, this month I have is higher degree. Um, something that's not on the slide that I, but I did want to point out is that the state of California limits the location of ADUs uh, in some areas, and they have one is it cannot be within a 100 feet from a property listed on the California Register of Historical Resources. Mm -hmm. So there's one aspect of California did uh, mm -hmm. intervene there. Um, so you see that they use the word impose objective standards, that's something we saw last month, all right? And, um, and but they're not, uh, they include, they're not limited to all the topics we're basically talking today, and some of them we're going to be talking about in the future. Uh, and they, they shall not include requirements on minimum lot size. So they preempt or prohibit that uh, minimum lot size. So do you know if when there's been state legislation, if that supersedes HOA situations? Uh, you'll see in a lot of these state ones, they do. They do. Not all of them. It's in. It's in, definitely in that spreadsheet. We have a, a column that says co covenant override. Yeah. And I'd say, I, I can't remember, so 50, one third of 50% say that they do override it. Yeah. They do override it. That's and I know that's something Adam's looking into. He doesn't have the answer. I'm not going to say he has the answer now, but that's exact specific what I was looking into. Well, based on the panel, being that HOAs are becoming such a huge proportion of our housing stock yeah. that if that were a role, I'm not saying it is, everybody out there listening, <laughs> just point of information, if that were a role for the state, that that is a place that potentially. Yeah, in, in Maryland law, actually, there are certain provisions um, in the Homeowner Association Act mm -hmm. that do override mm -hmm. uh, homeowners restrictions. I mean, Respect to composting and EV charging stations. Interesting. Um, there's also one, uh, an override provision for 
the use of a residence as a daycare center. Mm -hmm. But I believe that one is time restricted, so it's not retroactive. Mm -hmm. It says from this point forward, you can't have a homeowner's restriction. And that's totally fine. You can mm -hmm. do that. Okay. The, the, the difficult legal question is, can you override retroactive? Okay, yeah. so you're looking into that a little bit. Yeah, more. and I, examples okay. I give might be muddled. I might be. Yeah, it just occurred to me as we were looking at these and hearing earlier about the HOA. So thank you. Yeah, sorry. I just would like a follow up. Is that something that would be provided to us while we're doing our deliberations and ultimately making the final recommendations? Because I think if we're going to say X, whatever X is, or whatever mm -hmm. the recommendation is, in I think we should be clear that if it's a, you know, if it's a HOA you know, going forward, this is what, you know, the new law will be, or at least what can be, mm -hmm. versus, you know, what would the existing situation. So I think that would help me mm -hmm. in kind of thinking about how, what a recommendation would look like. So is that something we would get before? Yeah, I'm um, looking to Adam. I think yeah. Adam, so we'll count on for that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping to have it. Ready okay, so you're, but, you're, uh, it's in process. So maybe by the next meeting, you might have more information for us on that. Yeah, and there's okay. just one other wrinkle. We talk about other states and what they do, like California has very aggressive um, homeowner restriction override provisions. Maryland law is a little bit unique. It's got special enhanced protection for so-called vested rights, which um, it makes Maryland more protective of property rights and contract mm -hmm. and, and other forms of property than say federal law. So that's gonna, Stay through this as well. I was just going to add in about the HOA uh, and when we're looking at recommendations, obviously as a local elected official, I feel passionately about local control. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that one of our recommendations might be that the state takes action related to HOAs, because I would argue they're actually usurping my local control yes. uh -huh. of my jurisdiction yeah when they mm. restrict yeah. ADUs, because that should really be my decision yeah. or our right. decision yeah. as a local government, whether I want to allow ADUs or not, not some HOA's decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that could be a, a recommendation that would come out of our panel to recommend the state, you know, pass a law that HOA's are not, they can, those rules do not apply to the jurisdiction, you know, that the jurisdiction controls, whatever that local, whether it's the county or the municipality, the HOA is in, because I would argue they're kind of usurping our, our local control. Mm -hmm. and, and again, if, we're, if this if this were enacted in law and said, as of the date of the enactment of this law, you can create new HOA restrictions that limit ADUs, there's not a problem with that. Mm -hmm. It's really whether it overrides existing that were entered into 20 years ago. Yeah. There's contractual and right. property interests at stake uh -huh. there. You can check into that though. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, yeah. he's exploring that. Yeah. So okay. great. Okay. Sorry. Right. I just wanted to make one comment that I don't think it's up here that California allows up to two ADUs, as I understand it, per property, which is interesting. I have to look at it. I don't remember that, but um, okay. yeah. I'm, yeah, like we get a lot of comments about California's law in the public comments. If you, if you all are interested in learning about California, uh, read the public comments because there's a lot of there's a lot of comments about it. Uh, so I'll look in, in to yeah, that's a, obviously a big divergence from a lot of the other ones. That might be a newer part of the law too. That might be, but yeah. So let's yeah. Speaking of public comments, well, these are uh, this a sampling. Yeah, this is a sam sampling uh, specific, and I, I want to put out to the audience. There's a couple. A couple of people commented last time when uh, they said that I, I cut off their full comment. And uh, what this is designed to do is like some of these comments are really long, so I'm not going to put it on the screen. They're all in the stuff I sent you. Uh, and the full compiled ones as of last Wednesday when I compiled them all are available through that link. I tried to pull out ones that are just in those sections of comments that are really specific to this topic today. Uh, you can read the whole thing in there. So. Uh, one is saying a decrease, a decrease in green space is downright harmful in my neighborhood, right? So we're talking about a lot of coverage. Uh, we're talking about impervious services. Um, uh, so that that definitely relates to today's topic. Um, well, this one talks about parking. We're not talking about parking today, but it does say any special setback requirements, right? So this is this, this a public comment for housing people, not cars. Uh, any requirement for owner occupancy or minimum lot size? Um, 
they're, this, this one's against it. I guess I should have probably, if you read the whole thing, they're, they're against any requirements for owner occupancy of minimum lot size. Uh, this one gets into that uh, discussion about uh, permeable surfaces as well, uh, excluding driveways and other yard surfaces covered by permeable pavers from the calculation of impermeable lot coverage will encourage um, environmentally friendly construction and then potentially ADU construction as well. Um, and this one says there should be a minimum size allowed for any ADU on any lot in California. Um, I'd like to see a number of at least 600 square feet here. Um, so those are the public comments. I, but again, I, I will continue to send you all the compiled ones. I encourage the public to continue submitting them. Um, so I don't know if we have time for this, but so on public comments and for anybody who's listening or, or in the room with us, um, everything, the full comments are all coming in through the form on the want to just say again on the special web page that's on the set up for this. Everything comes in through Google Form. Yeah, it's in Google we're, Form. We're capturing the ones that we get through. Well. Yeah, and so I just, this is all being captured in part of our process. So I just want to assure everyone, everything's coming into the, into the system. It's not being filtered. We're giving everyone the full comments that are coming through. This is just for today. We've got a couple of like formal letters from organizations that were attached. And they're all in there. They're in there as well. So those yeah. weren't submitted during, through the uh, public uh, form. Very just the Google form. committed to having all of those in there. So right. holiday reading, everyone. <laughs> so... Um, I, Jennifer and I had a meeting talking about the scenario because uh, I know there was a lot of discussions about interest in scenarios. So we met last week, and I know this might conflict a little bit with the research plan where we we're going to do a scenarios all through one meeting. We kind of talked about it and thought it might be better to do scenarios when applicable um, to the specific topic. So we'll see how today's goes. We're going to kind of test it out. Uh, but hopefully we can use what we've talked about today, use what we learned to kind of walk through this scenario itself. All right, so let me see this. For All right, so here's uh, a property, right? Um, let's go over some of these details here. And then I wanna, I'm gonna, I, we're gonna talk about things that need to be considered based on what we've discussed today in relation to this property, right? So um, you see it here. Uh, and, and another thing is, let's go with the assumption, I know this might be a, a jump, but a, an assumption that with the property owner and the, Community, the jurisdiction wants this wants to support ADU development and would like to see ADU development either in this property or other ones like it. So we're going to go with that assumption here. All right. Um, so the lot size is 6,600 um, 66 square feet, um, and you see that it has an existing detached garage already on the single family uh, parcel. Uh, the zoning for this specific zoning district. Uh, permits a residential density of swell, seven dwelling units per acre. Uh, for unit size, the detached garage in which the owner wants to construct an ADU is 576 square feet. And that's 42% the size of the primary structure. For lot coverage, combine the primary structure and the detached garage cover 29% of the entire property and the impervious driveway covers another 20%. Don't know exactly what a cone driveway is. so. If somebody is to tell me that that's actually pervious, we'll pretend it's not. <laughs> it's like concrete. No, it's concrete. 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 It's an E. Okay. Con concrete. So it's not pervious. Good. I'll say that again. Combine the primary structure and the detached garage cover 29% of the entire property, and the impervious driveway covers another 20%. Right, for setbacks, the front and rear yards or setbacks are 20 feet, and side is five feet. And then for height, the primary structure and detached garage are both one story in height. Right, so let's go with those details and with the assumption that both the property owner and the government want this, we'd like to see ADUs on a property like this be uh, developed. Uh, what does a jurisdiction and or the property owner need to consider to ensure this ADU is permitted? Keep in mind that they are converting an accessory garage to an ADU. We looked at some of those examples earlier from other jurisdictions out of the state. So that, are they trying to increase the size of the garage or just convert it? I don't have that answer, but, would that, but, but that's something for them to consider, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We already looked at some, there's, there are different restrictions based on whether or not you want to increase it, right? You saw Baltimore City was 20% of a carriage house that was the biggest increase. So that's something they need to consider. 
Mm -hmm. Right, that property owner and the jurisdiction is like, okay, can we allow that attached garage, which is now 576 square feet, to be expanded? I wish. I'm sorry. Yes, Jen. I was just going to offer as well. When we were talking about the scenario, some of it is that we we talk about so many things just with text and thought process mm -hmm. out there, and so this was just to put something in front of us to say, okay, let's look at this. I know we already said like, we don't need to necessarily get into the exact setbacks, all of that, but let's look at something on the screen and then troubleshoot all of the things to think about with it, not necessarily have the answers today to your point, Priscilla, of what if we're trying to increase the size of the garage? So that was really, the because I feel like we had this great conversation of like, let's keep it high level. And then here we have something that goes right into 576 square feet. So it's more about what are the potential hangups that we can, or obstacles that then we can mitigate how to overcome those obstacles. Well, Thank you for to, to that point, I would just say to the earlier conversation of impervious, for instance, I would say if there was an impervious requirement, remove the concrete driveway and do a pervious surface there. Mm -hmm. And you probably solve that problem by doing a more pervious material for your concrete drive driveway square footage area. And personally, I would argue turf grass is not a good option. So then you get into details, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're driving up costs if you like, if you yeah. drive the driveway being replaced as part of that. If it's know. gravel, yeah. yeah. But you are doing the demo of it. You also have to see what the local jurisdiction defines as impervious because gravel is not considered impervious it's okay. pervious surface nowadays in a lot of jurisdictions yes right. i know annapolis is that way yeah i mean in arundel yes i mean they're pervious. And, the subsoil. and then you would look at the zoning requirements the height requirements you would see what is considered pervious versus non-pervious under the local jurisdictions and then you would have to see is there existing power sewer, water, and the detached garage, do you have to bring these systems in? Um, how would you, if the, this says it's a one-story brick building, if there is an ADU zone there, you have to determine if you're allowed to go higher than the residence, the principal structure, or if you have to keep the detached garage at a lower level. Um, and then, how would you, you know, convert the detached garage to habitable space and making sure that you're meeting all the required building codes? I'd hire an architect or an interior designer. <laughs> a couple of them. Uh, let's, uh, I, let's let Lori in. Okay. And then, okay. Okay. I think that discussion right there all I could see was cha-ching, 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 right? Dollar signs. And so I think that goes to the bigger discussion of how, regardless of what the recommendations are, if, if there's someone who wants to do this, there is a financial impact. And is this only going to be for certain communities where, the financial, where there is the financial means to do that? Because the mere fact that you just said, you know, and I know in our county, there's a lot of things that are done by the homeowner where they're not hiring architects and engineers because of the cost. Um, and just when, you know, just the mere fact of, you know, changing the driveway. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I get what, what um, Jennifer, you said in the beginning, like we started with the big picture, like let's not go down into the weeds. But I think this is a good demonstration of the weeds of if there's so many things that are required, mm -hmm. then does it impact the actually ability to do it for all incomes in all communities? Mm -hmm. right. Councilman? So as someone who has done different renovation projects and all that, the thing that jumps out at me, if you were showing me this as a scenario, is water, sewer, electric. Do I have to run separate lines or can I tie to the house? What am I going to, the garage is not going to have sewer. I mean, there's, uh, you should be, a, unless it has a bathroom already in, in it, which is unusual. So that means I'm going to have to rip up the concrete. I'm going to have to tie to the existing house. I'm, I got to run underground. So there's all those things that come in play. The more difficult, like if, if as a municipality, if you're trying to encourage it, if you're adding on extra connection fees, you, you, you're dry, all you're doing is driving up the cost. So it depends on, you know, so all those things have to be considered because if I can just simply tie, if my, my sewer line is in the basement of that home and I can literally tie to my existing sewer line in my home, 
and I have to rip up some concrete to get there, there's no additional charges. That's not too complicated. Running water from my house to that garage, again, is not overly complicated. But when you start adding separate charges, separate meters, and you know the electric, there's a chance there's already electric out there. And again, if that's tied to the primary dwelling, not a big deal. I have to separate do again, do a separate meter. So those are all those kind of things that are going to come up. And you're also assuming you're on a public, because if you're on a sewer, you have. Uh, if you're on septic, well, I'm looking at this lot. You would not. This is not pro public. Septic, no, no offense, but this will never mm. be private septic well or septic. No. It's too small. I mean, you, unless you are way, way old. Well, dry well. Well, we don't know. Yeah, well, it would not be modern construction because you're not big, big enough. But if, a lot isn't big enough. But if you're on a septic system and you add a bed, you have to make sure your current septic system can handle the new bedroom because it's counted by bedrooms and not by bathrooms. Yeah, well, there's 6,600. The lot size there is 6,600. You, there's no way you can be on private well or septic. That's just not, you can't do that legally in today's world. That would have to be an well, old, could, old house. Could be old, yeah. But good, good, yeah. One couple more comments, and then we're going to have to move there. Our comments. <laughs> I was just going to say, as as a whole, I mean, in just scenario thinking, the the private, you know, septic and well versus public utility. While not this scenario is, I think, a, a consideration, mm -hmm. and likewise is one of the things that really got me from the panel discussion. Um, the comment was aging infrastructure. I mean, we have that everywhere across the state. It's a, it's a very large concern. Um, and even tying in additional services mm -hmm. to the existing infrastructure still needs to be some kind of a stopgap measure or, you know, and again, it comes back to that, you know, what's the financial rep mm -hmm. repercussion of it. Um, but being in, in Baltimore County in one area that we, there's one water line that continuously is having concerns you know, those are those are things that impact counties, state. You know, I, I think that becomes something at a higher level that still needs to be, whether it comes down to the local or not. You know, I kind of look at it as like here's your checkbox of, you know, you got to make sure you're checking all these things. And you know, for your local municipalities, if you don't have something that discusses this, maybe this is the time to incorporate it too. Deborah does have her hand raised. Deborah. Um, I just wanted to consider lots implications uh, again in all of this. So we have a lot coverage requirement in this example, but what about instances where it's FAR based? Because then I'm thinking about what about um, house expansion, future house expansion, and then the detached garage and then sheds or any other additional structures that might go on the property and how that kind of impacts overall imperviousness, but then also just um, density of land and what kind of maybe environmental or other impacts there are there. Th what those is are my thoughts. AR. Four area ratio. Area. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we need to move um, to public comment. And then um, I would basically ask the task force for our closing round to be ready to consider um, these questions. Oh, you've already had questions. I can't um, intervene. <laughs> of course I can intervene. <laughs> we did want to build recommendations to go, right? So, uh... Okay. Anyway. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go there. I would like to know, in addition to what Joe would like to know in your closing round, um, particularly what you think at the state level, we should be considering related to this discussion around lots, the specific lot, if anything. And then I'd also like to know, was there anything of particular uh, that you heard today from the directors that really stood out as a, oh, new, new thing? So be thinking about those um, and we'll go to public comment. Do we have anyone in the room, first of all, still with us? Hi. Um, I, I think it's really interesting as far as the actual factors with um, your density, as far as the actual ADU, I think, particularly in the urban setting where you 
you have to worry about the high birth pressure treatment. So mm -hmm. that's that's basically what we're going to ascertain. You know, Observation from today. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Anyone else in the room that's here for public comment? Okay, Joe, online. Anybody or any chats that we need to pick up on? I can look at it. Let's see. Yeah. We've been getting a lot of comments. So okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure that we pick out any one particularly, but okay. uh, yeah, I think it's best for you to just read them all later on. Okay. Um, if I can make sure that they're saved from somebody, one of my esteemed colleagues, make sure they save the comments for me. So everyone that is including items on the chat, thank you. We are preserving those. And we'll read through all of them in detail because they will go into our public comment um, record folder, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, but there's two. Out there. How many people do we have, Joe, that are public? 51 participants, some of them 41 attendees. 41 oh, okay, good. That's great to hear that are not task force members. There's no way of distinguishing how many of those are state employees versus the public. <laughs> Uh, no. okay. Maybe if I look at the registration list, late, like the attending list, we can look at that later. Do we, really can place. we list, like we can get a list of participants because they had to sign up to get the link, right? So we do have that, that we can go back to look sort of who's attending. So great. And this is all continuing to be recorded, correct? It is being yeah. recorded, correct. Didn't announce that recorded. at the beginning. It's all recorded yeah. and also gets put on the um, web page. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, I'll put I'll put my questions up, but we got lots of time. So okay. We can. These are the questions I have, but we can go any direction. Well, let's do this, Joe. If we can take a couple minutes for the discussion component, but then I would still like to do a closing round because not everybody may have any to weigh in on these, but I do want to do a full closing round where I go through the roster and ask folks kind of where they're at in terms of anything we should consider specific to um, lots um, and what we heard today. And then I would also like to know just of the planning director discussion, was there anything that really stood out for you? Um, but so that'll, that'll come, I'll make sure we reserve about at least 10, 10 minutes at the end for that. So meanwhile, we'll take on Joe's discussion questions here. Just partly there, but. We leave them up or we leave them? Yeah, let's leave them up. So the first one kind of gets to one of my closing round ones, but I want to make sure I put everybody on the spot in the closing round for it. Theo. Yeah, I'll just open things up with, um, I think uh, a lot of the states kind of threaded the needle effectively in terms of saying not being more restrictive than the principal resident. Um, I think there are some situations with regards to existing accessory units that the um, if the existing accessory unit is is has a setback that is uh, less restrictive than the um, primary unit, having something that says it has to be as restrictive as the primary unit, maybe the uh, principal dwelling unit, may be problematic. But in general, I think just you know having as a baseline not more restrictive than the principal unit is, is a you know, kind of effective floor for us to be starting at. Right. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, again, I think you should just, I think it's pretty simple. I think you just tie into the existing zoning. I mean, I, uh, arguably, how is the, you know, it's called accessory, it's an accessory use. So if, if I were allowed to build a garage under certain conditions, why would I not be allowed to, if, if we allow ADUs, why would I just not meet the same requirements as what that garage would be? I, I think the more complicated we make it from a lot requirement standpoint. I, I just, we're not making it easier. I think we just tie into the existing zoning. You can ditto me on that. <laughs> ditto, okay. Um, anyone else in the room? Then we'll go to online. Yes. I would just say with respect to the zoning, um, what as the recommendations are kind of being put, formalized, there are some uh, communities that don't have that ADUs as part of their zoning. So there's good. So we've got to keep that in mind for those communities that don't have it. How would you either tell them now you've got to do it, you've got to incorporate it mm -hmm. and what that would look like. Um, so I think it's a great suggestion, but I think it's, you have also got to make, not everybody is at the same place mm -hmm. with respect to certain types of zone. Yeah, I think we're just, just oh, yeah. I was just going to, Clarify, but go ahead yeah. if you want. I was going to say what, what my point is, is it's accessory use. So all zoning codes 
already have the provisions though. regarding their yeah. accessory use. So the point is, it doesn't matter whether I allow ADUs or not, they, they, should, they should match what the underlying conditions would be on accessory yeah, use I, if I would build I agree with that. you there, but what I'm saying is that accessory use is, I know in my county, is very different than other counties. So that's what I'm just mm -hmm. trying to say. That it just because I'm not I'm not aware where everybody's from, but I'm just saying in my county it is extremely different. Mm -hmm. So because of that, that may not be a good fit because then there would have to be some major change in my county. That's all I'm saying. So regardless of where we land, we've got to make sure that if that is the recommendation, that it's applicable or there's gonna to have to be a new ordinance new zoning process, new, excuse me, no, new zone, zoning code to implement. That's all I'm saying. So, so what, what do they have for things like garages and sheds and so on? They, they have it, but they, depending on what the use is and how they're going to, it's, and again, I don't play, I do not play zoning director, but I do hear the problems when things can't be done. So I will say in our county, it, uh, the accessory use is a little bit more restrictive than I think people realize. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that. Which county are you? Okay. Prince George. You're, you're right. So I mean, so what the town council, this issue has been raised to our town council. What we are actually, or what they're doing is actually waiting for this panel to make recommendations and then they will make the adjustments. So I just want you to let you know, this isn't something you, they're, they're waiting for you guys to make this decision on what to do next because we yeah Brentwood doesn't have it on their books okay. so yes you can build a garage well no you can build a garage but a garage has a lot it's real simple sure right and the impact isn't the same and that's what i'm saying because right. of, i mean with you being you know urban i'm in i mean i'm in her county we're in the same county so we got rural and suburban so that's what i'm saying that that fix Percent isn't that? 100 fix for all that's all the same thing yeah but okay. that's all that's my the um, okay i want to make sure we get people that are online also uh is there any are there any hands up online um joe uh david <laughs> let's bring in because we haven't heard from david today yet let's bring in david uh hi madam chair can you hear me uh we can david hi hi how you doing uh, well, it's been a, i what's th i think um uh, I can't tell you how impressed I am with what a great job really the task force and the staff has done in bringing it along uh, this far. And I've had a lot of trouble sort of hearing and hearing specifically who's been speaking, but I kind of want to second the uh, suggestion that I just heard that almost all the zoning ordinances that we deal with allow accessory uses, as long as they're subordinate in some way to the uh, uh, principal use. And I didn't realize really until today how complicated this issue was and how many uh, uh, different versions of uh, ADUs there are in Maryland and they're all different. And I thought they were much fewer, <laughs> frankly, and I'm not surprised they're all different. I think Prince George's County notwithstanding that the easiest way May, may be just to say a, a, a ADUs would not be uh, considered accessory uses typically because they would add to your density requirements. You know, if it was a if it was two people in in a uh, in a uh, one family uh, a zone, I think I really like that suggestion. I wonder if we can't explore it further. That just would say that ADUs are part uh, are accessory uh, up to however many units we decide, maybe one, um, uh, 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 just like all other accessory units. If you can do a garage, then you can do an ADU. And that sort of bypasses. The, I didn't comment on the uh, <clears throat> last little example of the 60 foot lot, but if, if I saw a 60 foot lot today, the problem I saw with it is that was probably an old lot. You couldn't get a 38, uh, uh, you could not get a 38 foot wide house today with a driveway on the uh, side of it and meet all the all the typical setbacks. You would you would need variances all over the uh, place. So I think the easiest approach is to is to say let's make ADUs just like every other accessory unit. If you can have a garage in the backyard, then you can have an ADU in the backyard. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, we want to go, I want to go, um, to Mandy and councilman and then back to the online again. I, I just wanted to comment off of what the panelists said today. And I think 
you know, I'm always looking for the life safety of the inhabitants and egress in these ADUs. And I like maybe the amnesty program or helping homeowners that have grandfathered ADUs or apartments in their existing residence, bringing them into you know, current code or helping them make sure that we're tracking them. I think it's important, again, that everyone has a safe place to live. Thank you. Nice comment. Great. Councilman, and then back to Jennifer. I was, oh, and online. I was just going to say, you know, we're just making recommendations and and I don't think we, we don't want to confuse issues because right now we're just talking about lot requirements. And what my point is, so the impact issue of whether we allow or don't allow, you know, what counties allow and all that. My, my point is, I think we just need to keep it simple that the lot requirements, if it's accessory use, if I'm allowed in a certain zone to do a garage, it should be similar as far as what the setbacks are. Instead of making things overly complicated, you know, the more layers we layer on, the more complicated we make this, and it's the accessory use. Why am I coming up with separate setbacks for ADU as in, in comparison to a garage? As it relates to lot. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, over to Jennifer. I, I second that motion. <laughs> over to Jennifer, and then we'll take any other questions or comments from online. We saw a number in the state, a number of the examples from the state level, and I think it might be what helps um, from our state level through all of the the agencies is removing the housing density uh, for the ADU because then it truly is that accessory use. Because once you assign a, a density to it, that's where it can have the clauses of in different zoning mm -hmm. and everything else. So I think that comes, if we have that at our state level here, that the ADU does not count towards density as other states have done, then in that situation, everything becomes that accessory unit regardless of what's inside of it. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great summary. Let's go online. Um, who do we have, Amy? Um, hello, and I, I don't want to speak just to speak, but I want to uh, echo support to consider an accessory dwelling unit, just that, an accessory use. Um, that doesn't give me any heartburn because our jurisdiction is already regulated in that way. Um, so I think that uh, that's logical, but I, in the context of this conversation and for fear of, you know, uh, spears coming in my direction, um, mm -hmm. I, the fear that I have in, with some of this conversation, and I know that we are looking to facilitate um, aging in place and affordable housing options with an accessory dwelling unit. Some of this conversation is um, looking to give this land use a free pass or reduced fees. And my concern is that some of the uh, building code standards or some of the general accessory dwelling unit standards or accessory use standards that are applicable, if we are trying to make an accommodation for this use, um, there is the inevitable slide to do to be accused of being inequitable in terms of other similar land uses. So I just throw that out there as a thought. Um, also, the conversation about trying to give guidelines and seek legislation that will impact um, subdivisions and their ability to enact their own covenances, where those covenances are um, socially inequitable. I Obviously, I don't have um, any concern about taking those steps, but I know that there is a lot of case law that relates to um, a homeowner's association's rights to uh, regulate certain uses. And I've come up against that very uh, case law as relates to short-term rentals, um, which is another land use that we keep uh, butting up against during this conversation. So just from a local planning perspective, 
Um, I just wanted to make those points so that we're cognizant of unintended consequences when we're trying to fix something over here and what those uh, consequences may be elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. We're going to take um, Deborah and then we're going to do move into our closing round. Okay, just quickly, I think Jennifer mentioned the density issue, which I really appreciate you clarifying. I don't think I had that in, in my grasp. But um, my question is just to consider, or maybe for again, my own clarification, um, why would ADUs not be included in a density conversation? Because presumably they are additional people. It's not like somebody's moving from the house into the ADU. Is that a question you have for Jennifer? It's a question I have. Maybe it's a question we address. Maybe somebody can just help me clarify it. You know. Okay. Okay. Well, let's make sure the staff has that noted, and we'll try to make okay. sure we come back on that. Jennifer, do you have a clarification? Um, excuse me. A quick clarification for it. Excuse me. I'm so choked up by it. Um, <laughs> it's simply that there is so much already in zoning codes everywhere that discuss accessory units so that you would not have to make that overarching change by saying an accessory dwelling unit if you do not have that density in there then the accessory unit is that i mean that's one side of it um, there are implications all around and i think that's something that still would need further discussion to make sure we all agree to it by not having the density in there but it is one way to resolve the comment of what if there's, it doesn't specify, um, you know, for people to dwell, to be in that. So that's one way. And that's what some of the other states we can see have done is remove that density from it. Um, okay, just, we're gonna, and then sorry. I was gonna say, and you can clarify. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it goes back to like the scenario situation. If, if you have, if that example we use, so seven dwelling units per acre, say that's a built out community, and it's currently meeting that density requirement. And you're saying that ADUs are gonna count against density. You're saying no way ADUs in that community. Correct. Right, so, and we, we it's been mentioned by the planning directors. It was mentioned, I think Theo mentioned it last time, like, like ADUs aren't necessarily exploding. This, the idea is supposed to be like gentle density or something like that. Um, you know, and we heard it from our planning directors. And there hasn't necessarily been a huge explosion of this, even when they've loosened up their uh, zoning ordinances here. So I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I, I think when you're, when you're talking about density here, we, you got to consider what those density restrictions might imply and what they, a uh, loosening of them won't imply. Yeah. Okay. Let's Thank you. Let's go to it's closing round. I'm sorry, Deborah. I didn't want to cut you off. Did you have a final just, thought on that? Just saying right. thank you. I just didn't understand it, but it makes, that makes sense. Thank you. Right. Okay. I'm going to do a closing round. The core thing is, is there any thing of this discussion specific to lots, specific to state's role that you would like to ensure that we include in our kind of outcomes from today? And then secondly, was there anything in particular that you heard from the director's panel that was sort of a, a, a kind of a new information or just kind of surprising to you? And I'm just gonna go down through my list and start with Theo. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so in addition to the comment that I made um, regarding that, you know, it shouldn't be more restrictive than the principal unit, I'd also add, I, I think it's also important that we have some type of limitation in there that the ADU, that jurisdictions can't set minimums below 50% of the square footage of the principal unit or a thousand square feet, whichever is lower. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but I think that's uh, what's been used in some of the other state languages. 30% um, might be a little bit too low when you talk about some you know, small square foot properties. Um, in terms of what I found uh, new or, or unique about the discussion was I was surprised by how many jurisdictions said that this wasn't really big of an, that big of an issue. Um, I expected more jurisdictions to say, you know, there was a big fight around this, but a couple of jurisdictions said, you know, no, we had lots of support and you know, there was, we were able to address the community's concerns and we were able to pass them and, you know, it's gone well ever since. Great. Thank you. Nice, nice, quick summary. Laurie. Um, I would just echo a lot of things that Theo just um, mentioned with respect to the size. I think that my general um, thought would be we, whatever recommendations we do, we've got to make sure we're hitting all areas um, within Maryland, rural, suburban, and urban. 
Um, what I, I will say was amazing is the parking in Annapolis is not an issue. Like that was just, mm-hmm. I don't know if any, I was blown. Mind that blowing. One. I was just, Mind blowing. How is that not, that yeah. was not a, not my is, experience. Yeah, not my experience. So <laughs> that being said, but I will say my takeaway from the panel today was the intricacies and all of the different um, impacts in the different types of communities. So I think we have a lot of things to consider and I don't know how, where we're going to land because I don't know how we can address, not address, but at least consider and make sure our, we're thoughtful in our, the actual application of those recommendations in law from a state perspective. And so I took away with away from this was, wow. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Okay, over to Amy. Any um, uh, those two things I put forth, um, state specific to law and anything that was kind of new information for you? Um, I, I think that the statement I'd made a few minutes ago sort of <laughs> addresses. So you um, can pass also. Yeah. Yep, I can pass. Okay. Um, on to James. Uh, yes. Nothing new. I think I've made my point really clear. I will say the one thing is uh, that I didn't mention with our rental units in our town, they must be renewed annually. So a code person goes out looks at the town, wow. I mean, it looks at the facility. Mm-hmm. So if you own it and you live in Florida, someone, a, a code um, enforcement person is going to come to your home once a year to make sure that it's up to standards, if you will. Right. And so I, I say that because I heard earlier that someone didn't have that. Mm-hmm. For a rental unit in the town of Brentwood, it must be annually renewed. Um, and with the ADU, I would assume that would have to be included in that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, fire extinguishers, you know, the whole night. Right. So we do that annually. And if you don't pass inspection, then you don't get your rental license for the upcoming year. Great. Wow. So, yeah, that's something you might want to definitely recommend. It's hard or it's difficult depending on your staff, but, you know, our town's pretty small. Nice. Good to know. And, oh, and lastly, we would, the town did say once Maryland had made their recommendations, we currently have some in and they just would be grandfathered in to the current situation that you're looking at right yeah we've already looked at it because somebody brought that up earlier what about the old ones yeah they said they would just grandfather them in deal with them and they would still have to go through the inspection process nice. great thank you councilman Hoff. um i mean we already touched on the you know matching the underlying zoning but one thing that we didn't get into a whole lot of discussion about was the size thing i will say i'm not overly obsessed with the idea that we need to have a minimum size as long as it has a bathroom a kitchen you know it's a living unit um uh, but i do think context is important so i do think we need to have discussion regarding you know the maximum size because i do not want to see the situation where you is this a primary dwelling i just don't think that feels right and i don't think that's what most people think of when they think of an adu uh so i think we need to have you know some further discussion about that whether it's 50 percent of the primary dwelling or whatever that number is or you do a combination that the maximum would be you know 1200 square feet or a thousand square feet whatever it would be uh or 50 percent of because if you had a big bigger dwelling you can maybe have a 1500 square foot ADU you wouldn't, wouldn't feel out of place if you had a 3000 square foot dwelling um so I, I do think we need to have a little bit more fine tuning there I thought the discussion, the panel discussion was great. It was really wonderful to kind of bring that in because there were little tidbits. I know, you know, I'm looking at, you know, down the road for Westminster to do an ADU ordinance. And I was making several like, you know, star notes, like, you know, for when we do something, things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I thought that was really great. And as we continue to go through that, I think we'll get a lot of good information or insights. Um, So that was great, thanks. Great, thank you. So, uh, David, online, anything you want to make sure we consider as it relates to lots at the state level? I, I, I just think everybody's doing great, and I think we just should just keep uh, developing it and having the discussion, and I think we're on the right track. Great. Was there any big surprise or new information from the panel? I was surprised how many... Um, I was surprised at how many ADUs are, uh, uh, how many jurisdictions currently have ADUs and how they're all different and how all the responses to them have all been different. And I find it a little overwhelming. I'm going to have to sort of think about this and try and sort it all out. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Next up, Tiffany. You still with us online? Did lose Tiffany? Okay. Uh, Quinn, you've been quiet. What are your thoughts on today? Yeah, I'll be very brief. I, I, you know, I kind of echo the same comments with respect to tying into the existing zoning restrictions with respect to um, accessory use. Um, nothing really jumps out as me with respect to surprises from the panelists. I, I would like to, however, just thank them for their time and, and their efforts, you know, being here today and um, sharing their, their thoughts with the task force. So that's all I have for today. Great. Thanks, Quinn. Thanks for being here. Deborah. Well, I'll do the same and um, reiterate that I agree. I think it should be tied into existing zoning um, about accessory use. I think from my perspective as an architect navigating the various zoning laws around Maryland and then not Maryland's problem, but Virginia, DC, they're all like, it's like learning a new language for each one of them. So as much as we can simplify that, it would be really helpful. Um, to get, or at least clarify, maybe um, that would be helpful. And then I think on the size of, uh, on the idea of lots, um, size of structure, um, I'm in total agreement that we should not, um, we should not limit the minimum size, rather let building code do that. Bu building code's purpose is health, sa safety, and welfare. So they're going to cover the basis for why we have to keep minimum sizes of rooms. And we, I don't think zoning, unless we have a good discussion about why that's not correct, I don't think zoning needs to get into that conversation. I do completely agree that we should discuss maximum size. No major um, surprises from the panelists. Their perspectives were really interesting. I'm still just really interested how much of it could actually be tied back to how much of the difficulties are tied back to actual ADUs versus other factors. It's hard to, it's hard to say. Thank you. Um, Priscilla. Uh, um, I absolutely agree with no minimum <laughs> and a, and a, and a set maximum. Um, HOAs are a, a big concern for me. I really like the discussion about maybe being able to say that HOAs don't have that ability to control it. So you could work really hard on that. <laughs> um, I second that. Yeah. Short-term rentals are, you know, it's something I've been struggling with, and I've had a lot of conversation with the sponsors of both of the bills in Annapolis and Anne Arundel. And, and I, I, it finally came to me that in Annapolis, it's a unique experience. It's a unique situation. You know, those homeowners are able to afford to live in Annapolis because they rent to the Naval Academy families. You know, I mean, it, it's so unique in Maryland. Um, and, I, and I think we just should stay out of the muck with short term and long term, just not put any kind of limitations on that. You know, my comment about existing HO or ADUs is that I would bet, this is just my bet, that no one came forward in Annapolis, although they're speculating that there are at least 200 ADUs in existence right now. But if you come forward and say, yes, I have an ADU, please put me on the list. And then the planning department says, okay, now you have to bring it up to code. And that's only gonna cost you 30 or $40,000 to bring your existing ADU up to code. People are not gonna come forward. So, I mean, we just need to be realistic and say, what's there is there. Should I let you take your turn? I, I have to leave it. I have a hard stop at noon, but I, I just really quickly want to mention like the U.S. Access Board and consideration of who is going to be living in the unit. So like if there needs to be a ramp installed on, on the property, like on the unit itself, like thinking about like what is allowable within the Access Board's, you know, specific stipulations. Um, they have a lot of guidance on that generally. And I know architects obviously are very familiar with that anyway, but it's just something to think about for the disability population. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Um, Thank you. Uh, it's all right. I'm done. You're good. You're good. Okay. Uh, let's keep going then. Um, Mandy. Uh, I agree. But this existing zoning government govern. Oh, I can talk, I promise. And then I agree with the density you know, not added to the density. And there is existing building code and what the way it is designed is, as Deborah mentioned earlier, it's safety and wellness. And it's bringing 
it makes exemptions for existing buildings not to come up to what a new building has to be built at, but how can we make sure, again, the place, the dwelling person, <coughs> someone who is living in that is safe within their space. Yeah. And I absolutely agree with that. I just don't think people are going to volunteer to come forward for fear of what's going to happen to them. Well, we have to make sure that it's, yeah, it's an amnesty. Yeah. But anyways, Jennifer. Very much echoing many individuals here of allowing the local zoning code to do what it needs to do locally. But I, I very, I appreciate Theo, you're putting out their numbers as a starting point. I do think we need to have a maximum from a state level to just, you know, oversee what that looks like. And then certainly every municipality under that can always be more constrained mm -hmm. than that overarching. The things that surprised me or I found interesting today from the panel discussion, I thought it was a wonderful experience, wonderful discussion. It interested me that multiple people said the same dollar amount, $15,000 to mm -hmm. $20,000 just on the fees mm -hmm. side of it. So I found that interesting that that was similar across the board um, from multiple individuals. I also, the HOA really got me thinking right away. So that was one of them. And I talked to Jason at Montgomery Planning at the end. Joe knows this. It's a comment I brought up several times as he and I have discussed it was brought up by one person, never really addressed. And I asked the question after of, so what's the second generation? The, the owner buys it the, or the owner creates this. What happens next? Um, and so I asked him offline. He did not have, um, he was not able to answer that specifically, but I was going to reach out to him as well um, and so, ask that. That's good. If anybody has questions that, that you weren't able to ask, please send them to me, not to them. And I will... And I'll sit. And I'll contribute. Those answers will not just go back to you. I'll have them. That's not I'm at. Right. But that, I was just going to say that's my continuing kind of thought process in this. Is everything we're doing is for the existing owner? As I said, Joe's shaking his head because he and I have talked extensively of that's great, but what's next? And then next, and then next, because things get lost in the way it works. Thank you. I think I've got everybody through everybody. So let me just do a final thought here. Um, did I get it? Did I miss anybody? I don't think I did. Um, I think I'm good. So uh, first of all, thank you again. I am just so just incredibly grateful for this great task force. I mean, you all have been so thoughtful and great perspectives being presented. And it's just been really, really interesting and fun. So thank you all for that. I just want to, um, you know, I think I think the director's panel, thank you, Joe and team for bringing them in and, you know, their time. But one thing that I, I mean, I heard a lot of things already mentioned, but the one thing is what's the goal? Um, because clearly if the goal is to create either more housing stock toward what I would call maybe it's the middle, you know, the middle housing, or at least something that would be, you know, accessible for, you know, someone that I think is, has, limited income, whether they be aging or a young college student or a young family. Um, understanding that goal, I think, is core because these prices do not make this accessible for most folks. Um, and the more complicated we make the process, the harder it's going to be to reach that type of a goal, if that's the goal. So I think how we balance that in terms of how we look at this, I think it's going to be really considering, or I'm, I'm almost visualizing a matrix of like, well, if it's this, then, you know, you got this, but if it's over here, then you might be here. So I, I think that's going to be in a really important consideration for how we present the information and, and consider that. So I want to just throw that out there. And then I think just generally, um, you know, this, this reaching out, to the folks on the ground, we have Amy and others, and you know Mandy and others that are on the ground doing this. That's just invaluable, ultimately. So I think that's important. And we'll keep doing that through the focus groups, everything that's coming up. Joe has our next steps. I think Adam is committed to try to bring us more information on the HOA at the next meeting. And um, Joe, I think the list is there, but anything you want to highlight with the group before we adjourn? Just uh, one thing I didn't put in here is a reminder about helping with get that survey out to builders and developers. Very broad definition of what builders and 
don't want to talk about, I don't want to appeal to everybody that you know. Um, that, uh, thank you to the members of the task force that helped with today's panel, Priscilla, Lori, Amy, and um, Theo helped with today's panel, and those who have helped put together the focus group for January. If I can remember everybody, that would be Chelsea, Isabella, um, Mandy, right? Is it I can't remember. Yes. Thank you all. For it's all good. good. Team good. effort. Yes. Have a great and safe and, and have a great holiday. Hey, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you in January. This is when they get Thank you. Bye. <laughs>